all of that stuff. And uh, so he, he, Hilmar kind of headhunted me out of my previous job, which was uh, I was leading investigations for the special prosecutor's office in Iceland, which was set up to investigate the, the financial crisis that shook Iceland uh, in 2008 when we basically lost all of our major banks uh, in one week. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I didn't know how much you could talk about that. But um, yeah, that was um, so. So your background is not gaming at all, but you were part of that um, special counsel that was involved in those investigations. Um, yeah. I, I guess like how in terms of like all the types of data sets that you could have available to you, whether it's like consumer behavior related to bank stuff or, or trading stuff or, or any other type of behavior model. How did you why Eve, I guess? Um, cause, so, I mean, if, if, if we start at the beginning, uh, when I, when I did my training, which I actually did it in the U S I, I got a bachelor degree in something called, uh, security and intelligence studies, mm-hmm. uh, and, and the training there, which was, uh, basically all the, these were all ex, uh, CIA professors that were sort of leading this study. And they were always talking about like the key thing to understand complex human systems is is two things. You need to understand the the human incentives in in the system. And and the second thing is you need to find the 20% that move the 80% uh, or or otherwise known as uh, Pareto's law. And this is something that I have felt to be extremely true when you're analyzing complex systems. Uh, You need to really, really take your time to uh, prep to try to figure out where the 20% that move the 80% so you don't waste your time on the rest. Because in my experience, there is always a 20% that move the 80%, whether that be the 20% of the players that, you know, control the economy, the 20% of the players that are controlling the wars, or, you know, the the 20% of uh, whatever it is moving the other 80%. And and the second thing is understanding human incentives. Uh, if, uh, If a system like you know, the Icelandic banking system or the international banking system produces an outcome that is weird. Like in the 2008 uh, thing that started uh, the the international financial crisis, which was the um, subprime mortgage debacle. Uh, I, I don't know how familiar you are with that or, or how deep you want me to go into that. Yeah, this, go, hey, go as deep as you want. I'm really familiar with it on the U.S. side of things. I don't, I don't know much about it on the Icelandic side of things. All right, all right. So, I mean... You're you're kind of uh, touching on my mm-hmm. my uh, n- deep nerd with yeah. With go this. hard on it. Go real hard. <laughs> yeah, my understanding, so basically, it. in the U.S., the problem was we had um, financial institutions that connected international investors into pools of investments that were tied into risky mortgages, and then because of how interconnected all of that was, when the mortgages went down, it took down like investment people like all around the world. Like it impacted everybody because of that connection. That's my understanding of like the U.S. side of it. What what was what was going on with the Icelandic side of things? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I want to elaborate a little bit more on that, because what had happened is that healthy incentives had been uh, basically disentangled. So uh, they took mortgage, lo- mortgage loans, which had always had a triple A lending or credit score, mm-hmm. and they rebundled them into these subprime mortgage packages, which they then resold to insurance companies or and banks, because then they had a triple A rating, which is... Uh, means that a uh, insurance company that can only invest in AAA rated products, they could then get a lot of these investment vehicles. Uh, but what happened is that they, at the floor, at the ground level, in the in the local banks that were making these loans, that were actually lending to people who were actually buying houses, they all of a sudden had these weird incentive to lend more because it it all of a sudden wasn't their job to make sure the loan was paid because that was now... Uh, you know, somebody else's problem. So their incentive all of a sudden becomes, I need to loan out as much money as I can because then I can sell those loans to these investment vehicles, which meant that all of a sudden in in many states across the US, uh, you know, particularly states like Florida, which were really badly hit, Mm -hmm. you know, some average Joe with really low income all of a sudden could get a mortgage loan to buy, you know, an entire apartment buildings. The most ridiculous story I heard was, uh, when, a, when a Mexican immigrant who was a cleaning lady, she had uh, bought 11 apartment buildings uh, with with subprime, you know, with loans because 
basically the incentive was broken. Yeah. In and the this, U.S., this was, um, we call these Nina loans. So you had no income verification, no asset verification. You could walk yeah. into a bank. Yeah. Because the incentives for the bank, they didn't care if the loan went under or not. They just packaged it and sold it downstream. Yeah. Absolutely. And so the the fallout from this, so when, when this system crumbles, when, when the top layer in the chain realizes, okay, uh, actually, these aren't AAA rated products because they have been loaning these to people who, who probably aren't going to be able to pay them back. Mm -hmm. uh, that caused like a domino effect where people are like, okay, these are actually not as valuable as we thought. We're going to need to deprioritize them or de-risk them. Or, and, and that caused a, a, trip, uh, uh, a domino effect, which led to uh, credit in international markets to dry up really, really fast. And this is what the Icelandic banking system had uh, to a degree, been sort of uh, using to fuel its growth uh, abroad. So at the time, we had three major uh, Icelandic banks, which were all international, and the scope of them was that they had become 14 times the size of our economy combined. And these three banks all collapsed within this, the face of a week. Was all of this growth, like, um, what did you say, precipitated by the, the crash? Like, was it like in the 10 years leading up, these all grow massively because they were making money off of these types of loans? Or or were they just, they were just huge banks because they'd always been huge compared to the size of your company? No, no, they, they, had, they had grown uh, tremendously. Like they doubled in size every few months for, oh, okay. for a few years. Gotcha. And one of, the, one of the main reasons for that was that they had access to really cheap international credit. Gotcha. And when that credit dried up due to the subprime mortgage loan, crisis that started in the US, uh, our banks, uh, specifically two out of our three banks were so uh, massively leveraged that yeah. they just crashed almost okay. immediately and, and kind of took down the third bank with them. And so what came out of that is that the Icelandic government, I mean, people were super mad in Iceland naturally because this caused uh, our krona or Icelandic currency or ISK mm -hmm. to uh, crash massively, uh, devaluing like 80% in, in a couple of weeks and, and the housing market collapsed and, and all of these problems that led to like really big socioeconomic problems for a tiny country. So the country, I mean, Icelanders were angry. The government was like, we, you know, we need to figure out what happened. And then all these uh, evidence or, or at least uh, indications of potential market manipulation started to, uh, to, to uh, come out of of these crashes and that's when the government decided to set up a, this task force called the special prosecutor's office mm -hmm. and that is where i was working when when hilmar found me and then pulled how many, me over to ccp how many other people were working on that project on that assignment i guess in the special counsel it's like 100 150 people or something like that okay when, cool. when, when it was at its biggest Tying that into the uh, gaming thing, I'm, I'm really curious, and I don't know if the culture in Iceland is maybe different than in the U.S., but like in, in a lot of the Western world, games are still kind of like seen as like kind of a joke thing, like you do them for fun and they're for kids or maybe grown men that need yeah. to grow up or whatever. Did you feel, um, did it feel strange to go working, to, to go from working for something that's as important and with so much gravity, like a, like a global financial crisis, to go from working on that to like video game related stuff? Did that impact you at all mentally? Did it feel like the work was less important or do you see it differently or did people around you see you differently? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, definitely on, yes, on all counts. Uh, so for example, my, my mom and dad, when I, when I told them that I'd left the special prosecutor's office, which was a job that they were really proud that I had, mm -hmm. and they understood really clearly, uh, you know, why I was doing it, because uh, we, we were trying to make sure stuff like this wouldn't happen again in Iceland. And when I told them that I'd left that job to join, you know, CCP, a video game company, they they absolutely did not understand, you know, why I yeah, did I that. Yeah, I can imagine, like, yeah. And they were just like, why? Uh, <laughs> And they asked me like why for for weeks and then i invited them to uh the ccp offices in iceland which are really nice uh and we we take really good care of our employees so there's like you know like like most gaming companies have you know they have like game rooms and and, and like giant fish tanks and, and this type of stuff and my my parents walked through it and, and at the end of the tour my dad hadn't said a word he was like you know what this reminds me of this reminds me of when I took you to Disneyland. Uh, and so that was like, that was like his way of saying like, okay, I get why you left, you know, the special prosecutor's office. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, um, the first project I worked on was, uh, we had, we had developed a massive, uh, uh, we, we had developed like a underground economy related to gambling that was becoming a problem in the game and that, that the player community was, 
uh, increasingly pushing us to do something about. And I was basically, I was very relevant to the job that I'd been done before because mm-hmm. it meant like you, you had to trace, uh, you know, follow the money, understand what was happening. And, when you say, and, um, when you say gambling, so my understanding when I played Eve was there were these like third party websites that you could send ISK yeah. to and gamble to. Are you talking about these types of sites? Yeah, exactly. That's okay. exactly what's happening. So basically you were playing in the game, uh, you know, you, you could join, uh, uh, find a corporation in EVE and, and give them cash, mm-hmm. deposit cash to them. And then they would d- deposit that cash as credit in these third party uh, gambling websites. And then you could go there, play. And if you would win something, you would you would send a, a, a banker in that corp that you wanted a payout. And then they had like a delivery service where they would deliver your ship or ISK or whatever it was, depending on what you were gambling with. Mm-hmm. And, and this sort of slowly grew until it was had reached the size where the where the gambling corp at the time was was becoming the richest players in the game and they were starting to influence the game and mm-hmm. and of course this wasn't fair because uh, they were you they were becoming rich using a mechanism that wasn't accessible to other players so so we were looking into this but but anyways to at the time to, to ask, just yeah. I'm curious at the time. So Eve has kind of an interesting um, uh, position on scamming, whereas like a lot of games, if you scam people in game, you, it's bad. You usually get banned for it. But in Eve, or at least up until yeah. I left, you were actively maybe not encouraged to scam people, but it was a big part of the community. In terms of like depositing cash outside of the game to like win ISK prizes, is this something that's like explicitly against your terms of service, or was it a gray area, or how did you guys view that at the time? Uh, I mean. G- gambling is just prohibited in the EULA uh, mm-hmm. and uh, scamming is is fine by us. I mean, we, we for us, it's just like we create a, a socioeconomic system or we create a world with resources. And, you know, what, what you guys want to do with that world is between you guys. So if, if you know, Destiny gives uh, Trihex a, a, a contract for something and then he bails on it, uh, that's not our problem, and, and we, that's not how, how we view it. It's not our job to then come in and, and, and punish you, mm-hmm. unless that scamming involves, you know, you're you're breaking something. You're like using bots, or you're using un, uh, you know illicit third party licenses or, or, or applications, or or you did something, you know, that was outside of that. Then we would interfere. Okay. And and but but to get back to your question, because you were asking me like how. Yeah, I felt moving between jobs after after sort of I did that job, which which was super interesting. Uh, I I didn't feel a sense of purpose in kind of doing this, and and I went to Hilmar and and my uh, boss at the time, our previous executive producer, uh, Siegel, and I told them like, hey, I, I'm not sure uh, I have a strong purpose working for a gaming company, and then, and I was actually thinking about leaving, um, and then they both told me the same thing. They were like, oh, hold on, wait for Fanfest. Like, don't make a decision before FanFest. And FanFest is a yearly festival that we have in Iceland where all the uh, major players and, and the hardcore fans fly to Iceland and they have like a like a four-day weekend together and it's like a super big party. And, and I had heard about FanFest. I mean, everybody in Iceland has. It's such a huge thing here. So I was like, okay, FanFest was a couple of months away. And I was like, oh, I'll give this a couple of months. But I don't, I don't understand why, you know, a party would change my mind. Mm-hmm. But then I went to FanFest and I met the the veteran community and, and the community of the game. And when they were telling me about Eve, it was like they were talking about their infant son. It was so important to them. And they glowed when they were talking about their experience and, and the friends they'd made. And, and, and I was like, I've never experienced anything like this in a video game. What is going on here? There's something here that I'm missing. And after four days of spending time with these people, I was like, these people are experiencing something amazing, something that's incredibly important to their lives, and I don't get it. And and whatever I will contribute to this world of EVE Online is going to have a tremendous impact and consequences for the lives of these couple hundred thousand people that you know, populate our socioeconomic system. Mm-hmm. So there I started to find my, you know, my purpose for working for Eve. And that actually led to a long term research, uh, which was understanding why people seem to develop such massively strong bonds in the game and create such deep, meaningful friendships. And, and today that has become absolutely my purpose in the game uh, is, is to contribute to that because 
in a time where loneliness is, you know, an epidemic, basically 40% of all people 16 to 27 years old uh, say they're lonely and, and 30% in the age groups above, uh, Eve seems to offer something which is like tangible, meaningful connections. And, and that's what I've, that's, that's where I found my purpose in moving between these very different areas. Okay. That's cool. What, wow. um, yeah, what, um, so the, the, what I was most familiar with was apparently you were, uh, involved a lot in helping onboard like new players, like the new player experience yeah. is something that you worked on a lot for Eve. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. That, that was... Or yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, that, that became my second project after the, the gambling one. I, I ran the, um, the, I ran a revamped MP, uh, attempt for, uh, for about a year. Gotcha. For the gambling thing to, I guess, to close on that, you guys ended up like, did that, was that corp and all the people involved banned? I know that gambling is like illegal in game yeah. now, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The company ended up uh, after extensively looking into what that might do to the game, the community, uh, the people involved, we mm -hmm. decided that we just needed to ban this because this was creating very, very unhealthy behavior in a lot of areas in the game and, and creating actual victims, like in real life victims to due to gambling stuff. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. The, um, for the new player stuff, what do you guys, what kind of like data do you collect to find out like if something is working or not working? Like how, do, how do you even begin to figure out, like, let's say that you can see like players on average are, you know, 50% of players leave after one week of gameplay. How do you figure out, like, how does a player like that? Why do they leave? Why would they stay? Like what's going on? What kind of data do you collect for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what I've learned the hard way, absolutely the hard way, uh, I was definitely too arrogant to realize this when I joined the company, is the best way to understand why something is working the way it's working in EVE Online, uh, because it's so complex and there are so many options and there's so much data, so much noise, is to start to con contact and talk with the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and CSM, uh, CCP has something set up which is called the CSM or the Council of Stellar Management, where mm -hmm. the player community elects their leaders or their representatives uh, to, to the company for the player community. So those are like 11 uh, people that we fly out to Iceland a couple of times a year. And I can talk to those guys. We have, uh, I've developed now since I've been in this for a few years, I've developed really strong uh, relationships with people in the new player community, people in all these different communities that we have in EVE. And I usually start by talking to them. So when we were doing the MP, I, I asked, you know, like Brave Newbies, uh, uh, Karma Fleet, all these big corps that specialize in working with new players and, and, and onboarding them to the game. I was like, what what is needed? What is the struggle here? How are new players dealing with the current MP? What do we need to fix? Why? And so I actually did a lot of just data gathering, I guess, like that. And, and they pointed me out to like, you need to look at this, this, this. Uh, you know, people are struggled by the complexity of the game. You, you know, the more you can ease that, that's better. You need to connect them eventually with the player community, help them find a corpse, stuff like this. So that became that kind of targeted where we, what type of data we would look at. Okay. And what, what were like some of the big conclusions that you kind of drew from that? Like that, like what are the things that keep new players from staying in the game? And I guess how were, how did you try to alleviate those problems or have you, are you still implementing stuff for it or? I mean, I, I, uh, I left the, the new player experience, uh, about a year in, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is actually a decision I, I regret. I think that was a mistake, but, um, uh, when I left it, I mean, and, and, and sort of my impact on it was that we decided that the first two hours in EVE are the most difficult. So we wanted to try to make that experience really uh, positive and, and that it wouldn't be too uh, difficult for you. So we actually decided to try something that we'd never tried before with EVE, which was giving you like a linear uh, cinematic experience for the first couple of hours when we teach you the basic stuff in the game and we connect you to the main systems in the game. So we actually had like a choreographed battle that you could end up participating in where like you would see like where we basically created this massive fleet battle for you, which is kind of the end game for a lot of players. We, those are the best parts in EVE, but, but we simulated it. Mm -hmm. And and that definitely was a huge success. We reached out to all the major MP corps after this, we had a third party company do uh, analysis of how we did and, and 
when it comes to like being enjoyable, liking the first couple hours, that was definitely a huge success. But the problem was uh, it didn't link to anything. It kind of dropped you off after it. Another problem that a lot of EVE players complained about was that it was too linear and too rigid. There, there wasn't an option to sort of leave it. Uh, and and it didn't sort of give you the freedom, which is the re- the mainstay of our game is like you have a lot of do a lot of stuff. And it kind of kept that freedom away from you for the first couple of hours. So those are like, uh, not maybe mistakes, but like learning points that I would have loved to then, you know, move on to and and, and continue iterating on, on that MP that we created, which was called Inception. Sure. Uh, so, so, I mean, and, and that was, it was really fun. It was fun understanding uh, like why new players managed to stick around in the game. A huge part of that is... Uh, certain type of players really, really like Eve and manage to, uh, uh, they manage to really easily go through our initial steps. And those are like resilient players or people with resilient character traits. Mm-hmm. Uh, also people that know other people in the game that can sort of help them through the initial steps. These players usually really rapidly uh, start to enjoy our game and, and people that like, like puzzles, that like a challenge, that like the massive freedom that the game offers. We, we don't have any problems with those type of people. They, they swimmingly go through everything. But with like more casual gamers that are maybe just going to relax a little bit and, and fly a beautiful spaceship, uh, that's, the, that's definitely the sort of target group that we need to cater more to when we're, when we're building uh, new MP stuff. Have you guys revamped any of the um, PvE content? I think when I was there, the the height of what PVE offered was like incursions, which were still kind of not the most exciting thing to do. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a lot of content in Eve, a lot. I mm-hmm. mean, it's like 15 years of content, uh, and depending on what you like, there's no shortage of content. Uh, we recently created very high end uh, PVE content, which which you were calling abyssal dead space. And, and we've introduced a new race into Eve, which is like this, these mysterious triglavians that are coming from between these space pockets. And the player community right now is, is trying to figure out who they are and, and what is their agenda and what's driving them. And, and around them, we have developed a lot of new, really good uh, PV content that uh, is, increasingly, is increasingly accessible to also new players. Gotcha. This is kind of um, something that I notice, I guess, as a streamer. Have you ever thought about like the kind of like the observer interface for the game? Like, um, it seems to me that like the idea, like if I describe like a certain type of Eve battle, like ships, you know, trying to dodge, you know, sentry drones while they get closer to other ships to either get in wa- range to like, you know, web them or tackle them and fight. Like the, the descriptions yeah. of these fights sounds, you know, in, in my opinion, I think it sounds exciting. Um, th- like it sounds like like you're describing any other type of space battle. But if you try to show somebody this thing, like if you look at it on the screen, it's usually like a yeah. bunch of little boxes going around. Have you guys ever thought about trying to make it more interesting? interesting from like an observer point of view has that ever been like on your list of stuff to do oh absolutely absolutely i mean this is something that uh i know a few game designers uh Mm -hmm. the company are really interested in and and i would like to revamp uh and maybe uh, and that's something that i'm less involved in with the company that this is more uh, game design but but on on a related note i i did a research in combat in eve fun because I didn't understand it. Because I like I've never kind of reached these massive levels when I play the game. And and when I was talking to players, they were like describing combat shakes, like you know, like you get from actual combat where they're like physically shaking and then the nerves were all activated after combat. And I was like, like this is really, really they're describing really heavy emotional experience. And I was like, I wonder what this is. Mm-hmm. So I, I did like a six month study where I talked to so many players, uh, I, I, I observed combat, uh, I watched people physically when they were going through combat, uh, and I was trying to figure out what this was. And and my conclusion, I mean, this, this is probably far from being the only and the correct conclusion, but my conclusion to this was that the reason combats in EVE are so massively exciting and such deep emotional moments for players is they start planning them days, weeks, and sometimes months in advance where they're, where they have like logistical operations, strategic plans. Uh, They're pulling the right people together. They're fitting their ship. They've they've given this a lot of thought. And when, 
and this sort of slowly rises to these pinnacle events, which are these PvP fleet combats that they have. Mm -hmm. And then those are really like strategic moments where you need to, uh, you're less reliant on your like lizard brain, where it's like really fast reflexes and, and just muscle memory and much more reliant on like understanding like, okay, what is the velocity time? What is the speed? What type of ships do I have here? What type of fitting do I have in my fleet? Where where are my wings, you know, positions, stuff like this. And that type of strategic role is really big. But when they have a losses, and this is what kind of separates E from a lot of games, is our, our player community always says that the loss is real. Mm -hmm. And what they mean by that is, you know, like let's say you've built a Titan. It takes you six months to build a Titan in EVE. And if you lose that in combat, the experience is like, I can't reload or respawn this Titan. I just lost six months of my life. Like I really, really, there's there's a lot to gain and there's a lot to lose here, which means that the experience is really, really immersive. Mm -hmm. And that this is this is some of the magic that we that we find in our combat situations, which is, I think, really no other games compared to it, actually. Yeah, I agree, I think. There there have been a couple that I can kind of think of, but in terms of doing it like on like the grand community level, um, it definitely seems like EVE is, is pretty unique there. Um, what what exactly are you working on right now? Or I, I mean, with as much detail as you can say, but like, what's your current thing that you look at um, as part of a CCP employee? I mean, my, my main thing right now has been the, the friendship machine, which is understanding better uh, how how relationships are formed in the game and, and why and and what makes them meaningful and 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 how they form stuff like this and my, my second big project has been to um, i'm trying to grasp the the economy mm -hmm. or uh uh you know the and and that that actually is pretty close to a lot of the previous work that i did which is just understanding you know economic principles uh how money flows and why and and, and stuff like that. That's been super fun. Uh, we're trying to map out the economy. We're, the analytics team is creating uh, much better tools to monitor and understand the economy. And again, just like in this, as, as, as anything else that I've undertaken here, uh, I started by talking to the player community and it turned out like they had excellent tools to monitor the economy, to understand the data. Uh, they had excellent knowledge of what was happening and why. And, and like there are so many incredibly smart people playing our game, which have like college degrees uh, in in exactly this type of stuff, and they just excel at like understanding like where our market opportunities are rising. If we manage to get more of these modules to the market, we can gain a lot of arbitrage money, you know, opportunities. If we can close off these supply lines, that means that we own, you know, this part, which is very important for the upcoming war and and. All of this stuff, which is fascinating to to monitor, that this is the part of, that I love about the job. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm. Um, did you so coming from an economics background where you have like uh, like uh, I'm guessing like a pretty good real world understanding of economic systems? Was there anything that you saw in Eve that like surprised you that where players were either being more intelligent than you expected them to be, or or were doing something really stupid like trying to solve a problem that had already been solved? Like oh man, that, that was my that was my question, dude. I was I was I was so I was so <laughs> waiting for you to like so I can get. A, all right, but go ahead. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's a good go question. It's a good yeah. question. Uh, in every single case that I've looked at, the players have been smarter than I thought mm -hmm. uh, and and steps ahead of where I guessed that they would be or, or, or more sophisticated than I thought. And often, actually, you know, even more sophisticated than what I saw in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, can, I'm curious, can you give uh, like an, not to be too serious, but do you have like an example on hand where there's like some really complicated economic problem that you were surprised that players had actually solved? Can you think of anything particular? Not to put you on the spot too much. No, but I'm just, that's, that's kind of delicate information. I don't want to share something that's maybe like secret ways of, cause, cause players trust me when they're, when they're talking to me. Mm -hmm. And I, and I don't want to share like maybe this is their play style and that. Oh like, sure sure yeah like this is the best way to make money to and, and even then everybody does it yeah. and now that players and then, and then I go on and, and share it in this show and everybody's like oh we should do that and sure. and I break Ooh. their break their advantage. Scumbag Destiny wants yeah. to get back in there and get the early access pro tips. Yeah, Look at you. the best way? Okay. Um, okay. But, but I mean I, I I I can I can tell you a really famous example which I think kind of matches uh, your question which mm -hmm. is a really old example and this is known today. Like when we originally designed Eve back in like 2003, 
and it was coming out, we, we had calculated like everything with like w w what the yield was, uh, where resources were, how you could mine them, how many trips it would take you to mine an asteroid. And from this, we balanced the ships and, mm -hmm. and all the mining lasers and everything. And then we open up the game and, and we, we, you know, unlock this resource system that we've balanced everything for. And in like week three, our players figure out that you can jettison a can and like you, you can mine into cans and like jettison them into space and then other players can come and pick them up, which mm -hmm. means that the miners don't need to be flying around trips. This is something that nobody at CCP, you know, anticipated or foresaw. And and at this at that single moment, they broke all the calculations we had for all the balance and everything. And from that moment, it was like, I wonder what the players are going to do next. And that has kind of been the game. You know, we use some feature into the game where we expect like this will be used A, B, and C. And that's that's how they can use it. And that's how we can balance. And that's what we can expect. And then the players show up and they do A, B, and C. And then they figure out D, and then they figure out E, mm -hmm. and we're like, "Holy crap!" Like we didn't we didn't realize this would happen, and that still happens. Like every, like every month, I hear an example where we're like, "Oh, that's not what we anticipated would happen." I'm kind of curious, in terms of like design philosophy, every company has like a different way to approach these types of things. Um, where some companies, if, if players are doing something that they consider like exploitative or um, outside what they originally intended a mechanic for, they'll aggressively yeah. patch it to get rid of it. So like um, Lee, um, Riot, for example, does this. If anything falls outside of what they envision, they will aggressively, you know, try to patch it away. Um, are, are you guys like a little bit more let players do what they want or do you try to like clear up things that you consider too egregious? How do you, how do you decide like what's okay and what has to go? I mean, I think, I think CCP is more probably more like let's say fair mm -hmm. than most gaming companies in this regard. Uh, for example, like when when the company realized about the the jettison cans, I mean the the safest answer would have been we would have just banned it and then all of our balance calculations and everything would have stuck. But but at the time it was like this is super cool. This is offering. This is inviting more complex gameplay than we had designed for. This is creating really interesting conflicts. And uh, you know, let's roll with the punches. Let's see what happens. And I think that is usually the that's usually the way we approach things when when players start doing something uh, that we're not sure what what they mean. You know, like like when gambling evolved, we didn't shut it down immediately because we, you know, we we weren't sure uh, what this meant. But then we started seeing that it was actually causing a lot of problems and 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 making people's lives miserable and and creating unfair advantages in the game. And that's when we decided we, we need to stop this, we need to step in and do something. Mm -hmm. But when players like take a new spaceship that was designed to do A and they do C and D with it and and create an advantage through that, we never. We never even consider like okay we need to we need to stop this sure do you ever work nice. with um do you ever work with like other companies with like some of your findings like do you ever see for instance like blizzard or somebody else trying to solve or tackle a problem that you guys feel like you've got a good handle on and then you go to those companies and you kind of like share your findings or does everything stay pretty internal to your own company oh uh, no absolutely we we work with other companies we have we have a few companies that we work in relationships with where we share uh knowledge and experience with them and they share well with us. I mean, just uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a group over from Jagex that do uh, RuneScape. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was basically like a friendship journey where we were sharing experiences and they were telling us like, this is what happens to our players. And we were like, whoa, holy, holy cow. Like that's, that's what happens to our players. RuneScape then, seems knowing knowing RuneScape and having been a long time player of RuneScape and then having put like a pretty significant chunk of time into Eve that doesn't surprise me. Those two games seem yeah. to have pretty similar, especially with like the Grand Exchange. I don't know if they've changed it a lot, but the way that all of the market games and everything would work and a lot of the unintended stuff that happens in RuneScape would remind me of stuff that could happen in Eve. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and uh, and and it's always super useful talking to those guys. Um, uh, they've helped us out, out a lot, and, and I hope we've been useful for them too. Uh, War gaming is another. Uh, Wait, who? Uh, which gaming? You might cut out for a sec. War gaming. War gaming. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, and and so definitely we we and and I mean now, for example, Riot Games has a lot of XCC peers. Uh, so I I think, I mean I don't know if this is just standard in the industry, but uh, there there is always good feedback I think between studios uh if if you know we can have a good dialogue on like how to improve our games mm -hmm. nice 
Um, it actually, if I can't hear, um, so earlier you brought up, did you have a, uh, that you, that you have a big thing for behavioral science? And I kind of had like a pretty cool psychology question in that I'd love to know more about like the observed behavior of, of gamers within the Eve universe. Like when you went in at first with, with the, the new job opportunity at TCP, did you, um, did you, do you find that there, is there like gamer exclusive behavior where like you expected, I don't know, like, you, you know, like how humans behave in probably most plausible scenarios, but like, do you find there's something that happens that occurs in Eve that you find is not directly comparable to IRL, like gamer exclusive behavior? Is that really a thing or not really? The, the first thing that comes to mind is, so this is one of the things that surprised me the most. Uh, studying our players and how they behave is uh, we sent out a survey where we asked our players to self-describe like what type of gamer are you uh, and like 11,000 of our players or something answered the survey and I asked around in-house I was like what type of gamers do you think is going to be the prominent gamer and almost everybody said you know the ruthless the combat the aggressive players because that's kind of what our game is known for but mm -hmm. the highest by a margin was people that said uh, I'm, a, I'm a helper that self describe themselves as helpers. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was way higher than the other two, uh, way higher than explorers or, or tycoons or industrialists or anything like that. And I was like, what? Like, this doesn't fit kind of with the image that we have. And this doesn't fit with, and I was like, I wonder, this should be represented in the game. And I, I was wondering if, if I can see uh, more of the fingerprints of these helpers in the game. And I started looking more at them. And it turns out that the helpers have the highest retention ratios as well, and they're the most active. And so they're also like, you know, really valuable uh, mm. customers and, and really good customers. And when I when I started looking at them more, it turns out that because Eve is ruthless, because in Eve you can scam and you can destroy somebody's, you know, last three months work. Yeah. It also creates really, really strong opportunities to, to be helpful. And there's probably very few games where where your help is more valuable than in Eve. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you show up and you really help somebody in Eve, if you know somebody's just recently been suicide ganked or or lost his corp or or you know lost his sovereign territory or something, and you show up and help him, that person is going to really really appreciate your help because he understands like you are actually giving him back a couple of weeks of his life, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's why it seems that our game. For in our game, helpers actually flourish and they're attracted to the game. And this is something I didn't realize. And and to come back to answer your question, uh, Trihex, is mm -hmm. what I found out is that even though there's like these epic stories of like people having grudges for years in Eve and, and planning vengeance and creating spy networks, which takes like eight months to build, that all happens. But what I've kind of seen is when I've been looking at the aftermath of this is that you know, people get really serious in their character buildup, but they also really appreciate sort of the, the bond that's being built. And and when they meet at FanFest, for example, like we've never had like, you know, like groups fighting or, or something because <laughs> they realize that like this is, you know, we're all in the same team. We all love the same game. We're all living in the same universe and we're friends. Mm -hmm. And to that degree, I think actually uh, gamers are, are, are I, I don't know, better or more altruistic or... Or something than than in the real world, because you would you you know somebody that would scam you in the real world, you wouldn't show up to FanFest and just have beers with him, right? Even though the stakes are really high in both occasions, so I kind of liked seeing that. Uh, my experience has been that gamers, almost every gamer that I've met, and and like the vast majority of them, and and I see this in our surveys, they're really good people, and 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 they're primarily concerned with like you know, um, with, with, uh, just, just being nice to others. Uh, I don't know if I can phrase it, if I need to phrase it more complicated than that. No, I, I, I completely get it. You know, the uh, online gamers particularly, um, you know, oftentimes have stronger friendships than your next door neighbor, you know, like yeah. how, how well does, does the neighbor ex neighbor really know each other in the IRL realm compared to like online where your friendship there can just like, I don't know, develop in a super concentrated way for, you know, months, if not years on end. So I've seen it, I've seen it in WoW and like, I'm definitely sure it's like super strong in EVE as well. Yeah, this is absolutely what I learned as well. Cause I didn't realize that you could, cause unfortunately I have not built uh, uh, relationships of this depth that I saw in the game. 
So I didn't understand it, but but I've seen it time and time again that people build relationships that are the most meaningful relationships that they have in their lives. There was a really beautiful story actually a couple of weeks ago uh, from a World of Warcraft player who who uh, passed away, and his father uh, was shocked when when his funeral was that like loads of people showed up to his funeral who who were his friends online and they, and they like helped take care of the funeral and and were there for the family and. and like he had no idea who all these people were. And then he learned about the second life that his kid had had uh, where he was like a leader and, and, and he was like a really important person for a lot of people. And this, these are the beautiful stories that, that you know, you get to see and, and even witness firsthand when, you, when you're in a gaming company. It's awesome. Oh, my God. Well, can I ask you actually one more thing? Um, um, I don't think we have actually caught word here. Do you, like what? What was your gaming experience prior to being on a TCP? Like, I'm wondering, did you hop into the entire gaming ecosystem line, or did you have like some gaming experience prior that maybe made it feel a little less frigid to hop into the hop in the fray? Yeah. Uh, hold on. I'll, I need to plug in my computer. <laughs> Can you give me a chance to talk, Trihex? Because you're. <laughs> Dude, I, I asked two follows <laughs> for it. Just... <laughs> okay, God, I'm just <laughs> Look at how mad he is. Boy, April He's 1st so already passed. Right Boy, you better, oh we better, we better, so we better chill. We better chill. Okay. Are, are you being hackled, Triax? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to be relevant because, like, I don't, I don't have much to go off of here. You know, Mr. Mr. Uh, five no, X combo follow up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, go for it. <clears throat> All right. Um. So my gaming experience, uh, I'm I'm an RTS guy. That's those are my favorite games. My favorite game is uh, Red Alert One and World Warcraft Two, the the old school '90s games. Um, uh, I was a Brimbor my, player, so hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, me me and my uh, group of friends, we have this uh, yearly tradition where we go out to a summer house in Iceland, and we do like a four day land. Where we where we play games together and that's like one of my high points of the year and and like in the three to four months leading up to that there's always like serious debates about like what are the best games in the market right now and we we test play each game and we try to figure out like how do we best spend our time at the LAN. uh so like that's that's where things get serious for me when it comes to gaming wait um, what did you have there last year this is an important question <laughs> So the best game we've ever had, this is an eight person land. So, so mm -hmm. we meet and we, 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 we need to play games that, eight, that, that support eight people. The best experience we've had, you know, during the seven or eight years we've done this was uh, when we played The Forest. Uh, the Forest is a survival game where you like crash on an island. Mm -hmm. uh, and none of us had played it before, so we knew nothing about the game. So we just all landed on that island and we we're and we just thought it was a regular survival game. We didn't know anything about the game. Okay. And then once we had made like a very basic shelter, we were like, all right, we're surviving the night. All these cannibals show up, which we didn't know was a part of the game. And we were super like freaked about it. And then it turns out that there's like a massive mystery storyline built into the survival game. Mm -hmm. So so we played it for like 19 hours straight and it was awesome. Uh, and the biggest game last year was... Uh, Arc, the, the survival game as well. Mm -hmm. and, and we decided to try that one because the forest survival game was so awesome. Uh, but we ended up hating how slow the progression was. So we bought our own server and we accelerated the press progression like a hundred time fault. Mm -hmm. And then it became really interesting. That sounds really cool. Awesome. For, um, for stuff related to Eve now, um, okay, this is, so we talked a little bit before the show about like um, things we can talk about, can't talk about. So I'm going to, this is a really hard question. And if you don't feel comfortable talking about it, that's fine. Um, Eve is obviously notorious for filling all of your free time. Um, if you spend like time, like in corporations, especially if you're in any type of leadership or logistics role, you can sink yeah. easily a hundred hours a week into it without, without even a second thought. You can spend every waking moment doing this stuff. Um, do yeah. you guys ever worry about, or do you ever have talks internally about problems where players might be spending a little bit too much time in Eve? Is this something that you guys are concerned with, or is it not a huge problem for your findings? Um, so, I mean, we, we, we've done a lot actually to try to combat this mm -hmm. in, recent, uh, in recent years. Uh, for example, we're building something called the companion app now, uh, which is supposed to help you, uh, more casually engage with the game. So. So that you can, for example, take care of logistics and stuff like this, like preparation work, 
Uh, you can do that on your phone when you're on the go. So when you show up to the computer, uh, that can be more specifically targeted to you know your actual gameplay of of being in a fleet or or building a station or whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're definitely we're definitely answering or or trying to at least answer uh, sort of requests for this. Um, when it comes to like worrying about players playing too much, I mean anytime because uh, players do reach out when when they've when they've like feel like they're they're you know they've become addicted or they're or they're playing too much or something and they ask us to help them mm-hmm. uh, deal with it to put limits on their accounts and stuff and and we respond to requests like that absolutely but actually this I mean I I actually did a little research on this this is big of a problem as I thought mm-hmm. uh, and. A lot of veterans, maybe if you exclude like fleet commanders, which is a very specific, really demanding role in Eve, mm-hmm. which is only I think reserved for the for the elite elite players. But but most of our uh, veterans that have played the game for a couple of years, they've developed a methods where it's not like I have to sit at the computer for eight hours a day to be relevant in this game, uh, where they're more like uh, casually playing the game or or even like. You know, there's a thing called Netflix and Eve, Netflix and mining, where they do stuff like this, and then you know they only kind of engage really massively with it when they're when they're doing something with or against other people. Yeah, sure. So you can def- you you can definitely you can customize you know based on how much time you have to play. Mm-hmm. I mean, if if you realize you only have you know an hour a day to play, you can definitely have a meaningful, uh, impactful experience in Eve, uh, even even though that's your limit. We we've we have plenty of cases of of career paths like that in the in, in the game oh actually I have, I have a pretty dope question here so um from what i understand and of the eve player base like the there's there's no one's really a casual everyone's very very savvy and very you know emotionally intertwined into the game and on a deeper scale so like do you find because like comparatively i right, just use another example here comparatively like in in league of legends either like the, the bottom 50 percent of players are all "Quote unquote bronze trash," and they're not they're not very intuitive of the game and everything like that, or they just or they're just bad at the game. Do you find that your your curve of skilled players, where like you know, the, they're like even the most casual in Eve is probably proportionally way more savvy than the casual in another in another popular game. Do you find that's a good thing, or is that like not a really a, a, a legitimate metric to to measure? Um, I. I would not say that you you know you have to be hardcore to play. That's absolutely, I don't I don't think that's a truth. Uh, but I you're probably right. I don't know the number. I haven't seen the numbers for other companies on this. That that the average Eve player is probably probably a, a little bit more uh, hardcore engaged than the average you know player in most other games. Uh, the benefits of that is that I this is one of the reasons we have a very loyal player community. Uh, which which has like really deep ties. I mean, we we had the game for 15 years, and and we have a surprisingly large amount of players that have played it for more than 10 years. Like it's it's a huge amount. So so uh, Eve, you know, becomes I think a bigger part of a bigger part of the lives of a bigger part of our our players uh, than maybe most other games. But. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that that's like the only way to play the game or like you have to. What do you consider right now are some of the, as some of the biggest hurdles that you guys need to overcome? Like, what do you look, what are the biggest problems you're trying to solve going forward? Um, that you can talk about. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're still dealing with what I was talking about. When the, the complexity, like, for the average casual gamer, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that may become hardcore once he's uh, invested in the game or once he finds something that he really loves, but but entering the game, uh, and if he's just willing to, like, you know, m- many average casual gamers today, when they're looking at a new game, they may only give it, like, 15 minutes when they're just testing it out, and if they don't realize, if they don't find anything they like in 15 minutes, they leave, mm-hmm. and that's just not going to cut it with Eve, yeah. you know? doing it for 15 minutes isn't really gonna you're never gonna experience what is awesome about the game in 15 minutes Mm -hmm. uh but uh it's not like you need 15 hours or 15 days either just a couple of hours especially if you start uh early to 
to reach out to other players or, or, or try to mess with other players or play with other players, you're going to really, really quickly see why this game is awesome. Um, but I would love to, if we could lower sort of the entry barrier where people just uh, more rapidly realize why and how this game is awesome. But then we're sort of running up against 15 years of content that we have in the game, which is kind of the, like the complexity level that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I remember that for me playing the um, the two most, I think the, the number one barrier to entry, I guess for combat related stuff is knowing all of the ships is like so important. Like, cause you don't know if it's a drone boat or if it's like a frigate or if it's like a carrier, like somebody might see Archon yeah. and think that, oh, maybe that's like an, like, yeah, like a small ship that's flying around and not really know that that can be a, that was like a big bur uh, barrier to entry. And then people that used the stock overlays were absolutely roasted. You could get kicked out of fleets for that. If somebody, if, the, if a fleet commander found out that you didn't have like a custom overlay, you could get like kicked out immediately for that kind of stuff. Um, when you were playing, did we not have the, the tree? Not have the what? Where you could vision. There's a thing called in the game today called the ship tree, where you can visually see all the ship categories in the game and and how they're sort of located and positioned. Did did you not have that when you were playing? Um, yeah, I think so. You're talking about like the menu that you would bring up that would show like tier one, like frigates or whatever. Yeah, tier yeah. Two, tier two. yeah, you had that. I guess I was more talking like when you're in the field, like seeing like if you would see like a like a Proteus flying, like you wouldn't know immediately like oh Proteus is that like a little frigate that I could easily blast or is that like a big is that like yeah. a super carrier? Yeah, yeah. It was just hard to know that stuff and then yeah. But um, yeah. I mean, that's that's part of the learning curve. But mm -hmm. I mean, when you're initially trying out the game, you know, you can always go menu, and usually the pace of the game isn't like you know you see him and you have three seconds to respond. It's usually you have a little bit more leeway where you can like okay, you know, should I should I move away or or, or move towards this ship? I you know, and and then and then you do you know you right click you do show info and you're like okay th this is the type of player this is the type of ship, mm -hmm. and then if you know if you want you could relatively quickly find the info you need, and that is definitely part of the appeal that players talk about is that after a couple of these encounters where they're trying to put together like, you know, what is this? What is this about? What type of ship is this? They start experiencing this really, really strong mastery. Where it's like, wow, I'm really rapidly uh, moving towards understanding this. And, 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 and each engagement is giving me my like new strategic puzzles that I can place. And, and they start really experiencing this, you know, this strategic mastery progression curve mm -hmm. and, and which, which then you can follow for 10 years. Because it's like you can you can always go deeper in the rabbit hole. That's what Eve uh, definitely excels in is that uh, once once you're committed to it and once you like playing it, you there's like endless ways to go and there's endless extra knowledge to to take in. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you find that um, players? do you try to push people towards like larger group play styles or do you think that like in terms of player retention um is it more likely if you join like a larger kind of group so either a larger corp or a larger alliance that you're more likely to stand around than players that kind of do their own thing like i don't even know what you would do as your own thing like mining or trading or jfing or something like do you have a position on yeah. that or do you, yeah yeah that's a, that's a really good question and actually just really recently we looked into this tension numbers for different sizes of corps mm -hmm. Uh, what is really, really clear in EVE is that as soon as you connect with other players, be it, you know, you you fly in a fleet with them, you know, killing NPCs together, you start a corp, you start chatting with somebody. Like, as soon as you do that, uh, you know, your attention ratios go up uh, and pe people like the game better. They become more satisfied with it uh, and they stick around for longer. And then we looked at like, does it matter if it's a it's a two man corp, three man corp, fifty man corp, hundred man corp, two hundred man corp? And actually, the retention ratios are really similar uh, from a one man corp to a uh, ninety person corp. But as soon as it passes ninety, uh, the retention drops about twenty percent, like in a in a single swoop. So that's there seems to be some upper limit there. But it, the interesting thing is that it doesn't happen to corps that are part of alliances. And I had no idea why this was. So, so I asked at Amsterdam, which was which is a fan fest gathering we had in uh, Amsterdam mm -hmm. a couple of months ago or last month. And I asked them. I just showed this on stage, and I was like, "Can you help me figure out why the drop happens at ninety and why it doesn't happen at ninety for alliances?" Mm -hmm. And they, the way they explained it, uh, 
we, we looked into a little bit, and I think that's correct, is that if you're controlling a 90 person uh, group, as soon as you pass this, this number, roughly 90, it becomes really difficult to remember like everybody's names, uh, to understand like what everybody's doing. And, and just, it becomes really difficult for leadership to control a unit that is larger than that. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side for the individual, that's a part of the group, uh, you feel less meaningful and less uh, important to the group, you know, the, the bigger the group is. Yeah. And it seems that when the group passes 90, the individual in the group uh, starts to feel like, okay, now I'm, now I'm just a part of, you know, almost a hundred man corp. But when they're a part of an alliance, the alliance shares the leadership. So there's more people to answer questions and more people to guide you. And it seems that that can scale better with a couple of 90, you know, person corps together than if it's only a single 90 person corp. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, that, that makes a lot of sense because uh, I remember reading a while back, uh, I wish I had the quote here from the person or whoever said it, but um, I believe it's in human psychology that uh, humans can typically only maintain 150 meaningful relationships, right? And beyond that, you just like, you don't have enough time in a day or you're just like, you're just faking it. Like you're, you're yeah. at, there's a, there's a psychological capacity to that. 150 sounds like a lot. Point. Holy shit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. One one fifty sounds like a lot on its own. Like I, I'm, I, I think I'm, I've had to quantify my own and be like, you know, somewhere around maybe like fifty or so. But Jesus, I think I'm at like seven or eight. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you know how you interpret the word meaningful is like yeah. a, you know, a lot there. But, but yeah, that that makes a lot of sense though. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And and I I was aware of those numbers. Like we may we might see the drop off at one hundred and fifty or. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think that the drop off is at 90 because, you know, average humans have other relationships outside of the game that, you know, fill the quota and then the 90s, maybe the rest that you have or like th those are kind of the upper limits that we seem to have. Sure. OK, but it's a really clear drop at 90. That's that's what was interesting in the data. It, it doesn't like slowly start to drop at 90. It just plummets at 90. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. What? um. Or I guess, do you have any final questions or whatever? And then we can ask, I, I've got like one or two things and then we can wrap this up if you're good. For our tracks, I was asking you if you had any like other- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't know if you're talking to him or not, I'm sorry. No, I, uh, crap, I wish I had more, I'm sorry. But uh, no, so far so good. Again, Destiny stole my really good question. So okay. yeah, we already we already did it. <laughs> okay, I have, um, okay, I have one big thing ready that I'm gonna push you for, okay? And I know it'll probably never happen. Um, something that I thought would be really cool, okay? This is my, I'll play the game for free for fucking six months or whatever, okay? Um, if you do this, <laughs> and I'll stream it and everything. I thought it would be All really right. cool. I don't know if it's ever possible to do something like this, but if you guys started, and, and I know that kind of betrays the, the ideology on the game, but if you started like a new server where everybody started as like a level one pilot and ran that for like one year or something, I feel like that would be the most exciting thing in the world to have like everybody flying around and like fucking like frigates and shit again. And like the first time that people would like start unlocking carriers, it would be like a really big deal. I always thought that like an experience like that would be like super, super, super fun. And I have like a lot of old friends I know that would come back to like play for like a few months if like that would happen. Holy shit. All right, so so if we do that, you're gonna play the game for six months. That's uh, that's a that's a promise. I'll, sure, I'll stream it. I'll have my referral link and everything running or whatever. Yeah, and I'll try to bully other streamers into doing it. But all right, I'll I'll take this up with Hilmar, our CEO. I'll, that's about all right, sounds awesome. Um, yeah, that's my only thing. I always thought that would be really fun. One of the things that's kind of, um, one of the things that's always like really exciting is like the kind of like, um, oh, there was a name for this in World of Warcraft. I don't remember what it is, but like that that rush as soon as like everybody, there's like new content or that rush that you get when everybody like resets and you like go like pushing into stuff again. I know Path of Exile does it. Um, Hearthstone kind of does it. But like there's that, like that new feeling is really cool. And it was one of the things in EVE is that there's like this really high barrier to entry, right? Like if you're like, oh, I want to fly like a capital ship, you know, it's like, okay, well, you have to train your pilot for um, some number of months before you even have the ability to sit in one, let alone when you're yeah. proficient enough to fly it. Um, but yeah, yeah, I always thought that would be really exciting. But yeah, this, this sounds super dope because like uh, everyone's gonna be scrambling to like try to build those like like small small scale guilds into like bigger mm -hmm. alliances. It's just gonna be an absolute. You're not gonna get any sleep, Destiny. You're gonna be like, <laughs> yeah, no, dude, I would do that for. That would be so. Gonna, like, like that would be 90... so fun. 90 hour binge marathons i love it yeah and then like all the losses for like the first month like whoever loses like the first tier three ship or whoever loses like the first carrier whatever would just be like really fun it would be like insane stuff but yeah but 
Okay. Yeah, I, I, I like these ideas. I like these ideas. I, I, I think you're right. That, w- that would be super mm-hmm. fun. Wait, wait, wait. I got I to gotta be a bully, though. I got to be a moderator yeah. here. Oh, boy. Destiny, oh. You're, not, you're not allowed to reveal your identity. You have to use, like, a Smurf alt because I can't have all your DGG boys up here building the Destiny you know shrine oh, no advantage. that never that's not how eve works man people like oh, will get no? like your phone number and address <laughs> if you're going to be like in leadership for some of these guilds like people go real hard on knowing Wait, what every oh yeah holy shit i remember okay. um, do you know ghost do you, you know like the program jabber or whatever uh sorry do you know the program jabber that people used to like ping people i don't know if people still use this yeah oh yeah yeah like people will like own like if you're like in leadership in some of these guilds like you have to be on call like 24 7 for people to like ping you yeah. to like wake up to do stuff whether you have to like strut like a pause i don't know if you do that anymore like be ready for like fleet battles or if stuff something's gonna like shatter or whatever like yeah it was always like a really yeah yeah but the, those are those are only though uh i mean this is true but those mm-hmm. are only like the fleet commanders yeah 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 the... okay actually you know what? now now i actually remember a, t- a question okay. i want to ask one here. more so, so these um these these epic battles that I was I was bringing up on like where to begin the conversation here like I recall you know the big battle that happened in 2014 the, the another big battle that happened in 2018 that like made like Polygon and um and other such articles because of like just the scale of damage done you know quote unquote three hundred and thirty thousand dollars of in game materials blown up and everything seventy five plus titans and everything else do you find that those battles is it are they are they good? Are they good for the long term economy within Eve? Is it good for the player base? Should they should they be ha- should they should these like inter- massive interactions happen more frequently, or is it like better that to be like more world peace within Eve? And and feel free to reframe the question if I'm like wording it stupidly because I'm not quite sure. No, no, this is a really good question, uh, and a lot of people have really strong opinions on this topic. Uh, CCP has always sort of you know maintain the position that we you know we don't do stuff to to encourage wars or we we don't mess with like hey this you know group needs to attack this group or anything so so this happens organically which is the cool thing about it but when it happens we almost always see the same trend which is more people show up to play more people log on we get more new customers uh it, it attracts a lot of media attention uh and our players you know they love it they love this stuff because this is this is usually you know if, if if you have a war every three to four months you know a big war it probably means that it just took them three to four months to plan and, and be ready for the next war uh, uh, like in in the, in the big higher up levels but we have like smaller skirmishes happening every day okay cool yeah and and, and the, i mean the size of the wars in eve are ridiculous they're like really epic just like you said like we can have like three hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff and like thousands of ships lost you know in a couple of hours of battle and where there's like thousands of players in the same space we're actually running really interestingly um we're running a test case now with a british company called ether where we're trying to build uh these giant battles without any lag in it and we test ran a battle what was it a month ago or something where we had uh 10,000 players battling at the same time uh, without lag, and there was like 19 million projectiles shot. Mm-hmm. And this is re- this is some of the things that we're most excited about for the future of Eve, is that we can deliver this technology and the, and the battles can run really smoothly, even though we would have 10,000 players in the same time. I heard you got. I don't. I might be making this up, but did you guys change the way that drones function on the map, where they're like all one unit now instead of five individual things or whatever? Or is that are they do they still function the same way they did before? Because I remember that you guys were trying to figure out ways to like clean up like a lot of the tie dye stuff because it would like break really hard during huge battles. Uh, I I think that was just responded to with uh, more servers uh-huh. and like more more CPU power, but I'm I'm actually not gotcha. sure. Uh, uh, what is the answer to that question? <laughs> oh, they reduced. Someone said they reduced fighters from ten to three. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Um, do you have any like, like, uh, give us your pitch for Eve? I guess for people that are listening and are thinking about getting into it, but it's either too complicated or they've been scared in the past. What is your what is your call to action for new players to get them to join and try it? Yeah. So, so if what is really cool about Eve, what you what's going to be very difficult to find up to the game tremendous amount of freedom Mm -hmm. like whatever you want to do what type of character and 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 uh, career you want to have uh you have more freedom to craft that than in almost any other game you know do you want to be a space pirate 
Do you want to be a diplomat? Do you want to be an industrial tycoon? Do you want to be a fleet commander? Do you want to be a miner? Do you want to be, you know, like whatever you want, whatever type of career you want, you can have it and you can pursue it to like in, in really, really big, you know, do you want to be a trader? Do you, you know, the, do you want to be a spy? The list is endless. And once you started to own your craft, uh, you become valuable just because of the craft you've owned. Like as soon as you start realizing like, okay, this is what a good spy does, or this is what a good diplomat does. Uh, you become valuable to the community in the game and, and you become, you know, a sought after commodity because you are a good trader, because you know how to do good and efficient mining runs, because you know how to, you know, build logistical pipelines, uh, because you can show that, you know, you, you have had a successful trading story. Uh, and that is when the game starts to becoming super, super interesting when you start to build your network around your activity. And that can be on your own terms. You can you can establish your own corp and you can be like, I'm going to start, you know, the greatest trading corp in, in this section of space or I'm going to be, you know, the, the industrial tycoon with the mining, you know, I'm, I'm going to have mining operations in, in you know, 30, I'm going to run 30 sovereign spaces with mining operations or whatever it is. Or you could, you know, join an existing group and just enhance their uh, operations and qualities. And this is this is what I think uh, if, if you take the time to just a little bit uh, build, to just build a little skill in any of the areas in the game, you're going to start to realize like, whoa, this is, I can go really deep here and I, and I have the freedom to do whatever I want in this game. Mm -hmm. and, and CCP is not going to stop me. They're not going to show up and, and uh, you know, block me if I'm doing something that's maybe sketchy or, or that that is, you know, a new type of play style. Like I can actually push push the limits here. And that's what I think uh, any player that is interested by this type of play style or experience, he should definitely go and check out Eve and, and give it a couple hours and see if he doesn't like it. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, on that, uh, real quick on that, just because someone in the chat asked, um, he doesn't have to leave. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You can ask your question, Jax. I was, I was gonna say here like i also want to come in as like as a complete eve newbie mm -hmm. who, who who may one day hop in if this like sick level one reboot thing happens wink wink notch notch um the your description earlier about how there are majority helpers and like i don't know just like passionate people that actually was a strong appeal to me because i thought it was like a game full of like just like i don't know mass cannibalism which it, it might be i don't know it's kind of the thing on your framing of it but like Hearing that, like, yeah, there is some compassion in the game and that your actions have, like, deeper consequences as well as um, really impactful, I don't know, I guess they are impactful, right? And that, that to me, it was, a, was a really strong appeal even for me. So I'm just like, yo, that's that's really, really hype, actually. So yeah. I wanted to, like, let you know that that, that part way earlier in the interview was, like, really dope for yeah, me personally. Absolutely. And, I mean, if you, if you think about it, the, the like to play, you know, like the medic. In, in games that like to be like in the support role. I think those are specifically the types of players that, that will flourish in EVE because the, the, there's endless amounts of chances to really, really help people where people are going to be really appreciative of. And as soon as you have any type of expertise or any type of value or wealth or anything in the game, you can start to help others. And there's an endless supply of uh, confused newbies coming into the game that need your help. So it's, it's really easy to find them as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that is definitely an, another thing that uh, I think makes our game uh, really awesome is that if you like helping others and, and building bonds like that, Eve gives you endless opportunities to that. Yeah. Um, someone in chat asked, um, just because you, you um, a lot of things you bring up are things that like other games kind of say like, oh, like you can do logistics or whatever. Um, and someone in my chat asked, what do logistics people even do? Um, for like an example of kind of like how everything in the EVE world works, like if you have a corporation and you guys are like on the outskirts of space, like the logistics mm -hmm. people in your corporation are literally like the heroes of your corporation. Like everybody oh, knows yeah. the people that run. I said JFs earlier, JFs are jump freighters. Like anytime you buy ammunition on your market, um, so like if you play certain races, you have to like load ammo or crystals or whatever into your ship to fire. Anytime you need to buy a new ship, if your ship gets destroyed, the only way you can ever get these things down there is if the people that run logistics take the time to go all the way up to um, the middle markets like in the world and bring them all the way down to like the ass end of space where you might be. And like even doing something like that, like it is, involves like a considerable amount of risk. Like, I don't know if like do Rooks and Kings, are those still like in EVE? 
Uh, do those guys still play? Do you know? Yeah. yeah. So like these are yeah. guys who will literally like camp on gates sometimes, and they will blow up people that jump freight stuff like in and out. Like even like even delivering stuff from like high security places to low security places can be risky in and of itself. And like there's like so much. No matter like what role you fill in E, like you're usually pretty appreciated. You know, like people that do like healing, like logistics people, people that do like jamming that like play support ships. Like all of it is like really important. And there's like there's a lot of roles for you to play in um, with almost anything you could want to do like in a game like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and the, and the logistics people. I mean, they're they're called logies mm -hmm. in in our game. Uh, you were describing like the macro uh, element of it, where they're like running supply lines stuff like this. But I asked when I was trying to figure out the, what what makes combat in E fun. I talked to a lot of fleet commanders and asked them like, what is the most valuable person for you to get uh, in your, into your fleet right now? If if you were recruiting from the new players, mm -hmm. who would you most want? Would you want somebody who is really good at, you know, uh, at, at uh, at uh, scouting or, or at uh, fighting or and they almost all of them said like i want a good loki pilot like a good loki pilot or logistics pilot like it can't be matched if you have a couple of good logistics pilots like it, it strengthens your navy so much and i was like really like that 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 was not at all what i would have guessed and uh, and the second biggest answer was uh like e-war which is like uh like tackling Elect jamming stuff, stuff electronic like warfare yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, hey, listen, I really appreciate you came on to talk to us. Um, maybe at some other point we'll talk. Your life is, like, really interesting. <laughs> you've done, you've been involved in really interesting stuff, and the fact that you've wound up in gaming after everything is really interesting, too. So maybe in the future we'll have a more specific thing. Once you guys launch that fresh server, we can bring you back yeah. on to talk about your uh, new player experience and everything there as well. But um, Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. that, that yeah. would... I have, to, I have to, like, really continue to sell that further here. Like, you know... Eve came out in 2003. It's 2019. 15 years of seniority. That would that would make, I think, a lot of people hop in. That you that it, it would be a bigger impact than you may anticipate. Actually, maybe yeah. Okay. But okay, okay. yeah. Thanks a lot for uh, coming on. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, and I appreciate it. Well, it was, it was super fun talking to you guys. And uh, I mean, just hit me up if you if you want to have another chat. I cool. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Thank you, man. All right, take care. Back back in the States. I'm going to go out and, and throw some snowballs here in Iceland. Yeah, have fun. Have a good one, man. All right, bye-bye. Hey. <laughs> there he is. I could change the screen, but I kind of like it like this. <laughs> Wait, I don't know how... Oh. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a special guest cameo in the new... Um, uh, 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 Godzilla film. You know, I'm just going to be Godzilla and then King Kong and then me. How, how big I look right Wait, there. Wait, that's a new one that's coming out, right? The new Godzilla shit? Correct. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah that was a reference. I should have known that. Fuck. Is it? Yeah, yeah. That's going to be a... Um, it's a sequel to the 2014 one, which is like... Which the 2014 film was like independent or whatever. And then um, Kong Skull Island came out, if you recall. It was kind of like a quieter release. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's going to be like a, you know, like a monster universe, quote unquote, mm -hmm. where like uh, Godzilla and King Kong and maybe others will join in. But I don't know what other monsters there are in that same like universe or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's going to be like, God, quote unquote, Godzilla 2, whatever it's called. Godzilla King of the Monsters is going to, is, should contain King Kong versus Godzilla in some big standoff. Okay. Well, we didn't really do but this you, at the beginning because we had another guy here. What have you been up yeah. to for the past like week or two? We missed did, we missed last week, right? I think because I was traveling. We, we um, Destin, we missed the last two weeks. We missed the last two. Oh shit! Where what, yeah. what's happening? Yeah, so here? you, have you been? so so let, let me let me let me remind your loving fan base, all right? Because they get up my fucking ass when 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 we're not doing the podcast. I'm just like, well, holla at your boy. Better talk to dad. Dad's dad went to get cigarettes at the gas station, then come back for for fucking fourteen days Damn. plus. No, that so Twitch TwitchCon EU was uh ap the week of April eleventh. Uh, you dipped out by Wednesday early to go to go at Twitch EU and you know do do your thing over there. So yeah. no podcast that week. And then I guess you did so much like coke and whatever else yep. that you were completely um you know in a diabetic coma or whatever, and you were able to do it the, the following week after as well. Mm -hmm. And here we are now on week three, and now we're back stronger, better, harder, all that good stuff. Well, we're back. Well, what have you been up to? What have you done? Exciting. Oh, man. You better, have I, something uh, to show for it. you better have a damn good reason why you didn't go to TwitchCon EU, which was like the best fucking TwitchCon, too. Fuck. Okay, okay. No, oh, no, okay. Man. No, this damn. is actually, this is a great, this is a great topic yeah. here. Why didn't I go to TwitchCon EU? I didn't go because, well, mainly I couldn't figure out like a great um, excuse to go. Mm -hmm. Like TwitchCon EU, 
going to Berlin and all that was for for a two day convention was like a very weak a weak you know or a very easy no. I for me to go over there, I'd, ha- I'd have to be like a a week long event where it's like I'm going there for EU and I'm doing either a pre party or an after party where like me and some of the boys are going to do like some kind of like IRL squad stream adventure stuff, mm-hmm. which I just I don't know I I didn't. No one hit me up, or I wasn't being really proactive on it, so I had no no party to like you know do hood rat shit with, and so that's where we were with it really. Okay, it's not like it's not like you invited me to your party, so I didn't have any fucking. Yeah, anything. I got it. So basically, I just I wasn't a good enough reason to go, is what you're saying. I mean, you want to word it like that? I mean, shit. <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to word it how it is. So <laughs> I hate that you're delivering it so dry right now. Fuck. Oh wait, do you think this is a bit right now or? You're such an asshole. Oh my fucking god. No, it's cool, dude. I understand. We're not that close or whatever. It's fine. Maybe it's a southern oh thing or whatever. My, oh my yeah. god. Um, wait, 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 wait. What's, what's really going on? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you just really, are you still butthurt right now that I was in LA and we didn't hang out this uh, past weekend? Is that, is that no, what actually, about? I spoiled your entire project. Oh. Wait, oh shit. Hello? Yeah, no, you're still, you're still here. This is, oh no, I, my I, computer just like blipped and I don't know what just uh, happened. Can you still see me or did everything minimize? I can see you, but it you're gone on the. <laughs> You're going on mm. the screen. Oh man, I just got uh, hardcore super bogged. Holy shit! Ooh. <laughs> um, okay, well, everything keep, still. Keep talking. No, you, I'll you, bring. I'll bring you back. Okay. Don't worry. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So, um. Well, let's let's go over that too, actually, because like you know, I feel like I got like attacked from. I got gang bang from two different areas here. I had like the Destiny boys like, oh man, you, you went LA and you didn't hit up Destiny. You're such a fucking bad friend. And then I had. And that was that was that was like some of your boys hit me up whenever I, I peeked into uh I peeped in your chat a couple times. And then otherwise I had um I had Hassan literally like, oh man, friendship anxiety, where you at, bro? I'm in LA, you're in LA, why we didn't hang out and shit? Mm-hmm. And I was just like, dude, well, I wasn't first off one, LA is like when all right, you live in LA now, so it's like listen, whatever if a friend tells you, you know, hey, I'm in LA, let's hang out, it's like LA is like a no small that's like a two hour radius of like shit, right? Like mm-hmm. You can be in like North LA and be like fucking nowhere near someone in South LA. So let's get out the way here real quick. People also like to like kind of like use LA as a very general term of like, I'm not in San Diego, but I'm in SoCal. And it's like, bro, well, if you're like in Santa Ana, you're like fucking nowhere near me if I'm out in like Hollywood or whatever. Like, get the fuck out of here with that. Mm-hmm. So when I was in LA, it's like I was nowhere near Hassan, one. And then two, it was like I had downtime. I, had, I, was, I was out there for shit. Like, I like maybe like. I landed like 11 p.m. on Thursday, and I had sh- I had shit to do all day. I had like we had we had like a whole photo shoot and everything else. I had shit to do all day Friday and Saturday, and then I dipped out, you know, Sunday morning. So it wasn't like I really had ample time to hang out with anybody. But I'm very happy to redeem that when I'm back in LA, uh, June 4th, June 4th and 5th, and July 4th weekend. So I'll make it happen. Okay, sounds good. We're still, we're gonna we're gonna do some like IRL fan fiction erotica or whatever like has the stuff that mean, you've been involved in has that like released yet or no? Um, not in its entirety. Uh, Tempo Storm did did uh did tweet out the thing. You know, I can just like it's a it's literally a, a seven second clip here. You can see. Um, oh, we watched no it. We watched it on stream. I know what you're talking about. We did, though. Yeah. We did? Okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, man, I we were out there, bro. I was um. Yo, we were three and a half hours east of LA, dude. We were out in the fucking boonies, dude. We were like thirty minutes away from the nearest gas station. Mm-hmm. Like where we were, um, you you definitely wanted a Jeep north of the ride. Like paved roads and then gravel roads and then like roads in general were just like completely absent by the time we got to where we were. True. Like we were fucking out there, dude. It was crazy. You had a good time though? You happy with the end product and everything? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, dude. It was sick. The shoot was sick. Everything was sick. Y'all gonna see, dude. And like the um, the cool thing is, have you ever shot a commercial before, or like any kind of like extended skit, no, like where you get like no. a director? Okay, so whenever you have like a a film crew, a director, a script, they have to honor and all that. Depending on like the the screenwriter or whoever produced the script itself, like it could either be like really cringe stiff sterile dialogue that feels completely unnatural to what you would say it's kind of what they think you would say mm-hmm. and then you have like sometimes you know i wouldn't say full-blown method acting but like if the if the director's not a dick and kind of lets you like you know um 
tweak it a little bit. So I was able to tweak some of the dialogue to something I would say more, or things just sounded to me more organic, um, which I didn't, which I, uh, in my previous experiences with doing shoots, I didn't quite have that privilege. But you did for and this here, one. But I did for this one, yeah. And it was, a, I think it came out way, way better because of it. Like when you make it more of a collaborative thing. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not trying, I'm not saying I'm trying to be like, you know, like, oh, bless you. Sorry. I'm not trying to be like, you know, Edward Norton, where I'm, like, I'm trying to rewrite the Incredible Hulk and like, you know, literally be like a phantom writer on, on, on the thing. But mm -hmm. it was cool that I could just like take a, ba a very basic line of like, you know, you know, if you were, if you're being, I don't know, attacked by, I don't know, a secret agent, you know, what, would, what, what, what would you say? Like, what's your line here? Oh shit. Or like, oh shucks. Or like, gosh darn it. I'm getting attacked by terrorists right now. I don't know. Like, like, you know, what would destiny say in that, in that, in that exclaim environment? And I was able to like wing that a little bit more. Like we did like a bunch of takes. And so you're literally like, like Harrison Ford from star Wars when do you know the story? Mm, no, oh fuck. It. Was it before, um, before Harrison Ford's character is encased in a, not kryptonite, whatever the fuck it's called. Um, and uh, and Leah, Princess Leia is like, oh, I love you. And Harrison Ford was supposed to say, I love you too. But instead oh, he says, I know. Says, I know. Yeah. The, supposedly yeah. that was supposed to be Harrison Ford's like injection into the script there where he was like, it'd make more sense for him to say that or whatever. Well, I'm definitely a big fan. Um, and maybe I'm, a, I'm hella biased here, but I'm a big fan of like, do what the script says and then give me a take of like whatever, like, like, like start by doing the script. And then do your future takes where you're like kind of like giving it more of what you think, and then we'll let the editing team figure out which one works best. Sure, um, makes sense. But yeah, yeah, we, um, but yeah, we did that. Uh, it should be they're still editing the uh, the footage right now, but it should be live probably sometime next week, and then we can talk about it next week maybe if you uh, because it's ultimately it's going to be like a short film. It's going to be pretty dope. Cool. So so we got that going on. Um, what else have I been up to? I um. Well, shit. Um, I guess we kind of covered. Uh, I didn't know we were live way earlier, but basically, kind of covered the whole thing about the um, my my nearest button was a whole like movie theater employees not making um, being uh, exempt from overtime. We kind of already covered that one way way earlier here. Mm -hmm. um, what I've been up to, oh, shit, dude. It's been mostly my grandma still. Actually, uh, she's been recovering. I've been, I've been, you know, working on helping her and everything. She's like, uh, if you recall, she had a, she had a negative reaction to the cinnamon and her tongue swelled and it almost blocked her windpipe. And she had to be in the ICU ward at the, um, at, at the local hospital. And she's been recovering since then. Well, the good news is that uh, she's, she's, she has recovered um, completely now, and she has now she's doing like um, a therapeutic rehab. In order to like you know reacquire the ability to swallow food completely, mm -hmm. um, she currently has a pec tube in her stomach. Uh, she had to get that pec tube surgery so that she can like continue to heal, while still uh, reacquiring the ability to uh, swallow food completely. Pec tube is for um, streaming, or not streaming? I'm sorry. Why did I just <laughs> say that? Um, for um, <laughs> for like eating. Uh, yeah. So a, a pec tube is like whenever for some reason your esophagus or throat cannot manage to swallow and 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 chew food mm -hmm. completely. We still have to get nutrition and eat, right? Yeah, I got you. And what you have, and when you, when you have like an IV feed or like a nostril nutrition feed, mm -hmm. both of those are like short term solutions. Those are both like meant to be used for at most a week and not much longer. Gotcha. Because you know, you know, like any other muscle, you know, the esophagus and this tongue, the tongue are all muscles and if you don't use them, you lose them. You don't use them, they deteriorate. Mm -hmm. So you kind of want to get on boat with like using that shit so that it doesn't like deteriorate further and further. So um and the problem was she was running out of time to use the uh with the IV and the, and the um, nostril feed. Mm -hmm. She was running out of time for those like to not cause, you know, long-term damage to just like, you know, the esophagus and everything else. So the pec tube is um you know, it's just literally a tube that you put, it's a small incision in your stomach, comes out of your belly, and you're able to, like, you know, put in, like, let's just call it, like, you know, jumbo syringes. You're able to, like, syringe um, uh, nutritional paste into your stomach directly and, mm -hmm. and do that. So, like, it's really weird because, like, what happens is you don't feel particularly full. You just don't feel hungry. Like, you feel neutral. And then you come back to neutral, like you go from neutral to hungry or or malnutritious or malnutri mal malnourished. Yeah. And then with the pec tube feeding, you return back to neutral. You never feel the high of eating, tasting, swallowing, or getting full. You're just you just are. If that makes sense. So it's like if it's a 
So if you if you live the peck tube life, it's pretty it's pretty shitty, and she's like definitely very very annoyed with it. Yeah. Um. But she's been so she she got that surgery over the last three weeks. She's been recovering in rehab, and it's been going good. Um. So so that's that's the positive update there. But it's still been a lot though because like you know getting her, getting her from the hospital's local ICU mm-hmm. and rehab facility into a long term care like I'm talking about you know like a hundred days or so yeah and to like a, a comprehensive rehab facility where they have like more stuff for her to do in her rehab every day where she's able to like you know train on swallowing different thicknesses i'm sorry <clears throat> swallowing different thicknesses i don't know if i'm saying the right word here uh, of liquids mm-hmm. versus like you know just having to like walk and use like her use I both hands both thickness legs. of liquid is vis- viscosity i think am i making that word up is like how like um like how thick like a, li- a liquid is hold on yeah yeah wait yeah because they have, they have some where like um if it's like extra extra thick you actually have to you know you're used to like i don't know we're all used to like a very static level of thickness with our liquids that we're swallowing whether it be like water or gatorade or or soda or whatever right but mm-hmm. like there are there are, there are liquids that do get progressively thicker and you're you have to like really use your esophagus muscles and throat muscles to like really push the shit down the correct hole mm-hmm. you know what i mean so that's a uh and, uh, and and what I mean by that is because they're thicker, they move down slower. So the actually, you would think that um, a thicker liquid, I know this sounds, sounds so Luke, uh, a thicker liquid would be the harder thing. It's actually the easier thing. A thicker liquid gives your, it moves through the throat slower into the small, into the, from the esophagus to the small intestine. Mm-hmm. So it's all about like, um, you, you're giving your throat more time. It's like watching YouTube on like half speed or something like that. So like if you so if, if you can't get like the a, a very thick liquid that's moving down your throat slow down the correct uh, holes, then your muscles are not recovered enough well yet to be able to manage, you know, a regular liquid that would just you know go down like that. Mm-hmm. So that's what's been interesting going on with me. Um, aside from that, though, like uh, I mean, do you are we are we are we gonna have watched the Avengers before the next podcast? Actually, I was gonna say actually, yeah, I was gonna tell you that you know the, the elephant in the room here is the fact that uh, Avengers premiered in Los Angeles uh, this past Monday, uh-huh. and yes, I will have that. I'm I'm watching it tomorrow, um, for sure. Um, I'm super excited. I think I'm watching uh, it on Saturday, so yeah. Cool. You know, we're, we're gonna have like a fucking. I actually really enjoyed our 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 us session. Where we kind of ran a little bit there. Mm-hmm. Like so far, we watched the same movie. I think we have a really great discussion about like it's unfortunate that we don't have like the um we don't have like contrasting opinions or takes on it, anything we've, we've watched so far but you know Captain Marvel I think was a great session mm-hmm. us I will, one was a great session I'm gonna give a warning right now the next time we have this podcast it will be spoiler heavy it will be very spoiler heavy if you don't watch it between now and Wednesday fuck off get the fuck out of here with that shit okay. yeah I actually have to agree like the whole idea of a spoiler free review to me is like. I don't know. It's kind of like, why bother? Just like the time you're sitting there watching a spoilery review, you could just go see the movie. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm not, I never, I never watch spoilery reviews. I'm just like, this is all like blue ball and, and, and filler and none of like the, you know, the, you know, I'm not watching, I'm not watching porn for the cringe acting. I'm watching for the, for the, I don't know. You know, they get, I don't know. It's 2019. Maybe some people do watch porn for the, uh, for the porn acting. Maybe. I don't know. Depends on, uh, I, don't know. I guess what the scene is, right? Yeah, we'll have to see. I don't know. You have to have to ask someone else here about that one. Did you see Shazam? No, I did not actually. No, actually, I haven't been to the theater since um, oh fuck, what since us actually? So no, I have not seen Shazam. Uh, like I was kind of busy with the whole like um. I didn't see Shazam. I didn't see Alita. I didn't see uh Aquaman. Um, I, I've actually been, I've been pretty bad on movies honestly. Um, and I and, I, and then I like I saw Captain Marvel and I'm like, ugh, goddamn, I wish I saw all the films. I wish I had saw instead. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like the last three films I saw, I believe, are um, Us, Bumblebee, and Into the Spider Verse were the last three things I saw. Okay. So I've, I've been I've been pretty been pretty mild slash tame on theater visits this year. Uh, also, I, I thought I was gonna go see Dumbo, but then like I uh, I just didn't care enough. I guess I don't know. Like I don't know. It's like maybe it's because like Tim Burton's been kind of like hit or miss a, a lot for a while now. But like I, don't know, I just couldn't see myself to like. I kind of knew what it was going to be. Maybe the trailer revealed too much to me, but I was like pretty passive on seeing Dumbo as well. Okay. But I, I, no, but I do think it's unfortunate. I do need to go see Shazam. I heard Shazam is really, really good. So, 
Um, I must see that but beyond beyond that. I think I had another. Uh, oh, well, you know what? Okay, I'm sorry. Let's go back here. So the after party from the um, uh, uh, from the CC, CCP uh, ghost, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the one thing I wanted to ask him about, but I, I really didn't know if uh, I didn't want to make him feel uncomfortable. I don't want to make him feel unwelcome. I don't want to make you put you in an awkward situation. So I just ultimately played it incredibly safe here. Okay. But the, the question, in the fucking elephant in the room, bro. Oh, God. I wanted to ask him about, because I, I don't know, right? The monetization models in Eve. Mm-hmm. I want to know how the game functions like how like as, is it how financially viable is it like is it working do they wish it made more revenue like is like how does the financial stuff in Eve works because when he he briefly touched on it here he said that you know that the the gambling mm-hmm. when the third party site gambling was legal in the game that there were victims mm-hmm. that were you know devastated by it or whatever right and I wanted to ask so badly here do you find there are parallels with victimization? Uh, and exploitation psychologically of people who, who who get introduced to these gambling elements, these modern games, whether it be loot boxes or, um, I think what else is there here? Like, I guess particularly loot boxes, right? There's or mobile games, games. period. Or, or yeah, mobile games, right? Mm-hmm. Do you find? Did you like? Did you observe where modern gaming is headed with these explo- exploitative practices of their fan bases just to exploit more money out of their out of the participating players? Mm-hmm. And do you find that you have a loyal, a very loyal, passionate fan base now because you don't engage in those things? And that'd be kind of a question tethered to like oh, how, the, actually, how the revenue. I don't know if that was, but again, I didn't ask that because I, I thought it was like way too high of a button. I didn't want to put them in. Yeah, a really good position. question. What about to ask about cosmetics? Yeah, what, if they would ever consider, because I don't think. Uh... Oh, is there not cosmetics in um in Eve? No. So the way that it works, or the way that it did, I don't think so. When I left, was um, basically you have these things called pilots license accounts or pilots license something they're called plex p-l-e-x in game and the way that you would um the way that you would uh fund your account basically is you would have to activate a plex and that would keep your account active for a month and then you'd have to buy you'd spend like 10 or 15 dollars or whatever and then you get a plex in game and then you'd use it um and you'd buy it you could also sell these plex on the market too so players could um Players could, um, like, theoretically in EVE, I hate saying this because you shouldn't do this, but theoretically in EVE, if you work hard enough in-game and you make a lot of money trading in-game, you can buy other people's plexes off the market and you could fund your account for free. You could play for free. You don't have to actually spend any money because you just make so much in-game, you just buy it. But um, that's really, really hard. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I hear a similar thing in RuneScape. You could, um, you could technically, like, do a thing and just, like, you make... I don't know, was it like $3 million in game? And then that that will buy you. And it's enough to actually buy the one month subscription for 15 bucks or whatever. Oh, really? I had no idea. Oh, apparently yeah, they do have cosmetics I... now in the game as of January 21st of this year. Oh, cool. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Um. Well, shit, dude. Well, that was a question I would have asked. Um. Well, then, well, okay. So if they, if they just introduced cosmetics now, then mm-hmm. like, is, is, in your opinion, is the main monetary model just a subscription, like the, the, the entry barriers, the fee that you pay per month beyond the free trial? Um, I believe so. That's all you generally pay. There's not, they don't have like a lot of microtransactions. I don't think, unless they change it. People are saying that there are like skill injectors you can buy now. I shouldn't say anything, I guess. I haven't played the game in like a few years, so. Uh, tell me about that, because I, I don't know how much of it you played here. How long did you play Eve? Like, I think for like a play? year or two. But when I was in it, like I was like pretty hardcore into it. Like this was like like expanding to take up like all of my time in the day, and like offline time would be spent on Eve as well. And then like I got into like a like because I we because I basically I brought all of my people from my stream into it to start playing. Um, I like was the head of like a large corp and then like a fleet commander for a while. So like I got like pretty heavy into a lot of the different elements of the game. But it was, I mean, so it was a lot of fun. You know, Man, but... you said your idea doesn't fucking matter. You came into the game, all all of Destiny, all of DG boys coming in with you, praising mm-hmm. Dad, giving you giving you corp leadership. Boy, you, you better boy, you better take a smurf when I get this level one shit reboot happening. Well, like the problem is that like when I play games, like what you're saying, I would actually prefer. Actually, like when I play um when I play games, it seems to be that like this four to six size group play is actually the most fun. So I would say like in Rust. Playing with like four to six people is a lot of fun. And Eve, doing like four to six people is a lot of fun. But the problem is that like as a streamer, if I go into any game, I'm going to get dogpiled like a motherfucker. Like I basically have all of the um, negative aspects of going in. So I might as well capitalize on the positive. As shit as that is, it's kind of how I have to you do know, it. You know what? You know what? Mm-hmm. I apologize. You're totally right. Yeah. I as, agree with what you're saying though. Like I do, I no, do have a much no, different no. experience, right? You're yeah. totally right. I forgot. Listen, you know, I, I, I've, I've played very little online games, but... Mm-hmm. Having been stream sniped in Dark Souls 2, which I know is a very minor example of stream sniping, but like, dude, mm-hmm. that put me getting stream sniped is like a special kind of tilt, dude. Like, I, I, f- 
fucking lost it. I wanted to like go like I wanted to punch a wall, dude. I was like, how can people be this caliber of an ass pie, dude? I don't, I don't fucking yeah. know. I, I for like for reference, like an Eve, um, when you're in high security spaces, high sec. It's supposed to be a no PvP zone. If you attack somebody in high sec, I think there are like NPC ships that will one shot you. They like insta kill you. Ooh, However, fuck. if a ship is small enough in high sec, you can still kill it. You can if you one shot it. This is oh earlier I mentioned like when you alpha something, that means you kill it on the first shot when you alpha something. So like when I first started playing, that's real not really true. Wait, what did I just say that's not true? When you get concorded, don't you die like almost instantly? Am I wrong on that? Um, okay, I don't know what people are fucking memeing about. But, um, like, when I was playing, when I started to play Eve, like, I literally had a couple people that were, like, trying to camp, like, my beginner frigate that were, like, trying to suicide ships that were worth, like, 10,000 times more just trying to, like, kill me immediately. Um, oh, yeah, it might not be instant, but it's pretty fucking fast. Like, I don't think you can, like, out-rep, like, lo like, Concord shooting you or whatever. Like, you're gonna die, like, pretty quickly. Um, also, hang on, hang on a second. Re really important here. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at your screen right now. Oh my god, you gotta, you gotta. If, oh, you gotta use, listen, I can't. If I you're can't. Gonna use a picture of me. Let me get, at least just give, give me, give me the, give me the money, dude. Here. I you, can't. Um, I can't like add like your camera back again. I don't know why. I no, can't it's like. Cool, it's cool. I also Look, can't cycle that's through. That's fine. Use this chat as fuck picture of me here if you're gonna use if you're gonna use something like that. I'll do it. Um, I'll I'll do it. I'll do it for the next episode if I need to. Okay. I can't like bring up Discord ever because it fucks everything up because of the way the overlay is. I'm sorry. I love you. No, I I I'll do an Instagram picture. Yeah, uh, but I can't like, like I can't click over to my Instagram because it fuck or not my Instagram. I'm sorry. I can't click my Discord because it fucks everything up if I like move the move like if I click the text box. Um, okay. Because of the way that the camera should. You know what? No, this is all right. Hang on. Now you're gonna now you're gonna get a rant from me about a serial. Oh thing. my god! So, Here we go. Listen, listen, listen. Another no, try to complain. Let's go. Shut up. Listen, okay. Here's what I hate about the internet. All right. When you're a known personality, and, and this is this applies to you too. This is this is not just like a, a you know ant, you know victimizing me. It's a victimize you as well kind of a rant here. No, no one warns you what picture is gonna be used for like the the Google meta metadata like when you Google <laughs> oh, yeah. Destiny. Nobody warns you like the most random the picture you have right now is a most random fucking Twitter selfie that was more meant to show how my afro looked like Vegeta. Mm -hmm. Um whenever because I, I slept on one side really, really hard or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was just a random picture about that. And now it's like it's got this like the synthetic overemphasis because like if you Google if you Google Trix and this this pops up, I'm sure it's probably how you found it so easily or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, oh dude, these these random pictures that I didn't plan to be like, you know, the flex ones. And then by comparison, I give you the fucking, like, I give you practically, like, I don't know, fucking e-boy cam whore porn to, like, click instead, and, I, and, and I, it, it gets crickets. Well, that's how it goes. If it makes you feel any better, there's, like, really, if you have, go into Google and search for Big Brain. Big Brain? Yeah, okay. under images. Big Brain. Okay. It's my life, man. <laughs> Dude, I didn't. Okay, I thought it was going to be like, I don't know, some celebrity, ironically. I think it was. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? You thought it was going to be some celebrity? I'm a celebrity, motherfucker. Calm down. Damn, chill. Oh, oh you know what? You know, a Hollywood. Get, get your ass out of here. You're like internet famous. You don't you do not do a real job. Hey, Fuck out of here. You, enough, you, play, okay. you, play, you play games for a living, dude. Like. Dude, like the difference between like playing like Mattel board games and Battleship and like what the, whatever the fuck you do is like barely tangible. Get out Damn. of here, dude. Damn. All right, I'm gonna remember this one, Triax. You better watch yourself, Mister Speedrunner Jet Set over here. Okay, calm down. Hey, like I mean, like dude, you're sitting here on a computer all day, like not changing the real world, fucking. Hey, chugging down your, how's your, your Doritos um, and Mountain Dew. How's uh, your? Smoothie. First of all, you mean my soil into my hot fellow, chocolates? Okay, chill. Basement dwelling nerd neck beards. Wait, what? Um, I drink soil and hot chocolate chill. What um are you guys still doing D and D? How's that going? Oh, it's going sick actually. Um, I will admit, um, everyone agreed to Friday. Um, and I think that was a giant mistake because like, uh, what happens is like if you travel for the weekend, Friday's uh -huh. a giant no go for a lot of people. So like, you know, Hassan has like political shit to do with TYT, so he's like, he's probably like. 75 percent attendance so far for fridays mm -hmm. um surprisingly i've been i've been gone i probably have missed like the most i probably missed three to four sessions so far mm -hmm. um and just like you know it's like this really weird conflict of like you know if we're if we're down two or more people do we just skip that week 
Yeah. You should be doing. I think I named um, so, you this when you guys were just starting. I think I made this joke. I don't or I don't remember if I made it to you or someone else, but the hardest thing about D and D is actually the scheduling, is getting everybody together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's probably that's probably the worst thing. But so so far so good. Um, and if you want to, if you want to hear about that, actually, uh, so at first uh, I'm a I'm a Dragonborn Druid, and the problem with that is it was my first time ever playing D and D, like like real big boy D and D on stream. I played D and D prior, but it was like 2011. It was like you know just some friends, and it was super casual. Mm-hmm. Here, I mean, you know, we're playing formal to the T, and I'm trying to like you know do you know some some RP with my my character or anything else, and I um. Um, being a non-human character is pretty hard whenever I'm inexperienced at RPing because, like, you know, the thing to do is just like, self-inject your, your character and on, usually on some some human traits to it because you're you know, you're human, obviously. Mm-hmm. And uh, being a Dragonborn Druid, it was just like, I didn't know, like, really what direction to take my character other than being this fish out of water who's just, like, going to be this, like, racist, condescending, smug asshole to all humans because I'm, I am the one non-human or I'm the most non-human in the group, I guess. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't really uh, – that was getting, I imagine, pretty boring for everyone involved. Um, and I was trying to figure out where to take it now. So now my character, like – um, my character did some medicinal mushrooms in a forest. I, I got high as fuck. Okay. And now I, I've had an epiphany where I'm like, you know what? No, actually, humans are great. Humans are the backbone of our modern society now. You know, dragons don't r- rule the world like they did a thousand years ago in this universe. So I'm going to go and befriend – female humans for the purpose of procreating because that's what the male humans do so i'm, I'm so i'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to fuck and so that's my that's my new thing now so i'm like my the plot is comical so i'm sitting here like i'm, I'm motivated by like chad bro tendencies of wanting to get laid as, as quickly as possible as frequently as possible okay we have that character in our D thing it's called captain barbara but all right <laughs> And and there was also there was slightly um, a case of a uh, murder hoboing in the very beginning here. Like we wanted to fight uh, everything and everyone uh, for a while. Um, <laughs> Our poor guy. <laughs> did you see that? Yeah, I did see that. Yeah. The message <laughs> pop up. Yeah, dude. I... <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna have no oh idea. God. Oh the con! Like, oh my god! I'm. T- <laughs> I'm like, Triax apparently posted a picture for me to put on my thing, and he uh, and I just seen the bottom right the pop up of the message. Uh, apparently, Ghost just said, "Nice job, you're very swole or whatever." Yeah, nice. <laughs> dude, he has no, <coughs> he has like no context. Dude, fuck. Yeah, he has no idea why you posted that. Oh nice job. fuck. Okay, so um, so yeah, we're, we're both gonna see uh, Avengers in game. We're gonna have like a, a very a very in depth spoiler tastic um reaction thing next week. Mm-hmm. Um. I'm taking it a little bit more, uh, I guess, I don't want to say seriously, but, like, just like, you know, it's, it's the biggest movie. It's, you know, it's, um, what, a 12-year, a 11-year no, no, tentpole movie event. And so I'm not even going to be on the internet tomorrow. Like, I don't even want to – I heard it's already leaks now. Yeah. I, I've seen people who are, who are deliberately diluting spoilers with fake spoilers so no one knows what's a real and what's a fake spoiler now. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to, like – I don't know. I don't even want to, even want to risk tomorrow, dude. I just want to like chill tomorrow, take tomorrow off, and just like go see Avengers ASAP, and then and then I'll come live and stream. Like I don't even, I don't even want to be on the internet tomorrow, day mm-hmm. of premiere. Like fuck that, dude. I'm already hearing some people in USA were somehow able to see it today. I don't know how they're able to see it earlier or whatever. Um, but like, yeah, fuck that. I'm just gonna like chill tomorrow and do that. Did you watch the Star Wars Episode Nine trailer? Oh yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Um. Yeah, um, <clears throat> um, what's, what's it called again? The, uh, the the title of the film, The Jedi, The Rise of Skywalker. The Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, yeah. Um, what does that mean? It could mean a couple of things, right? So, um, if I recall, um, fuck, what's his name? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm brain farting right now. Not not Luke. The uh, moody moody angsty belly belly crop pants. Oh, Kylo, Rylo, Kylo, Kylo Ren. Yeah, yeah. Kylo Ren. Here we go. Yeah. Um, Kylo Ren is not a Skywalker, correct? At all. Mm, so, because yeah, it could, because like, mm, yeah, no, yes, yes, he is, right? Wait, no, he's not. Wait, yes, he yeah. is. Okay, wait, because Princess Leia and mm-hmm. Luke are siblings, and they're both Skywalkers. And Leia and Han Solo had a kid, so he's like a Skywalker, right? Like, right? He's like fifty-fifty. Well, because the question is like, you know, Rise of Skywalker. Does that mean Rise of Kylo Ren, who's going to like 
you know, um, dissolve from the resistance and join, or dissolve from the rebellion. Wait, wait, fuck, I'm, I'm using two R words here. The bad guys and join the good guys. Good lord, who the fucking Skywalkers, goddamn. Um, or, because technically, the, uh, I forget what, um, I forget what, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm brain farting so hard right now. Oh, no. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm like, uh -oh. I, need, I need more, I need more caffeine in my system right now. Um... I'm sorry. Who, who's the who's the actress that we all love who who passed recently during the filming of episode eight? Oh my God, Carrie Fisher. Carrie Fisher, yeah. Um, Carrie Fisher calls the good guys in episode eight. Is it the rebellion or the resistance? I I, I forget. They're actually. the resistance, aren't they? Okay, they're they're the resistance. Yeah. So he's gonna like leave the empire and join the resistance, and then that'll be the rise of the Skywalkers. Or is it gonna be more about? Um, is it about his transition? into finding his, his moral his moral landing and moral finding ground or is it going to be more about um uh ray um is it uh is it, or more about ray who's going to you know um really rise up and be the leader of the skywalkers and like and just be the 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 super saiyan badass that she's always been destined to be or whatever someone in chat says it's rise of skywalker because ray and kylo are both taught by luke and they're going to be his best and last students that carry his vision and his name through the galaxy that sounds that sounds, that sounds pretty credible. That's not yeah. Like it could be it. Now, here's a real question, though. So that's all that's all standard fare to me. The real question is, like, how much of Episode 8 is going to be retconned for Episode 9? Because I think the thing we both agreed on here, we were talking about Episode 8 briefly in the past, is that, like, Episode 8 um, kind of closes a lot of things on what was, like, open-ended questions left for 7 to be explored throughout the trilogy from 7, 8, and 9, you know? Uh, Ren's parents, they were they were nothing. Mm -hmm. Um what, what what's that um uh, what's the little fucker's name? The uh the dude who dies in the red room? Um little what's like Squidward or whatever? It's like Squidward Tentacles. Oh, I would have I knew it right before you spoke, said spoke, yeah, spoke, Spock. Something like that. Spoke? Okay. Yeah. Dead. Wait, you Snoke. Know, um, Snoke. Yeah. Okay. Dead. Um even even Finn uh Finn's arc. Finn with the the, the female stormtrooper with in the all chrome costume. She mm -hmm. also dead with nothing really to show for it honestly um just a lot of things were tied up at episode eight and you're just kind of left with like well what what do you wrap up in the grand scheme going into nine mm -hmm. other than i guess like kylo doing something or, or ray doing something sure okay well i guess we'll find out when it releases um we're coming short on time and there is actually like a really interesting question in the subreddit that i really want to ask i'm really curious what the answer is okay Ooh, uh oh um oh, oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. We, you didn't we didn't pre-screen questions here no nope, we didn't yeah, but this is what i really want to ask you okay whoa, whoa. Uh, cnn taught me that you can pre-screen questions for an opportunistic gotcha gotcha well answer. we're on, not whoa, cnn whoa. here we're uh the moral <laughs> party okay we get our marching orders from bernie sanders okay right, do you that? remember the aoc clip that surfaced and the term code switching yeah, the one where she put on like a Brooklyn or like a, a more urban accent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Have you seen um? You, have you seen the show Atlanta? Yes. You know the guy. Oh, yeah. I love the, Atlanta. The, the guy that tells like the flow rider joke or whatever. Um, the main character's white friend or whatever, and then he asks him later to tell it again when he's in like a car full of like black people. Oh yeah, and, and, he, and yeah. is he gonna drop the uh, the n word with an a? Yeah. Yeah. And he, and he doesn't. Yeah. Do you feel like do you have do you feel like you have experience with this or do, do you have any opinions on this or how does it? I'm Ooh. just curious. Ooh, okay. Okay, you, you put me in the hot seat here. Okay, yeah, so do I have any experience with code switching? Um, you have like a white friend. You see him act super white, the whitest person ever all the time. And then he comes up to you and he's like, yo, what up, brother? Or whatever. And he's like doing some crazy. You're like, dude, you do not normally talk of this. Has this happened? Do I do it on the podcast? What do you think? Let's hear it. Do you do it? No, you you're consistent. You're consistently triggered all day and all night long. So no, Thanks. you're 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 you're, you're good. Yeah. Uh, as far as code switching goes, I think also the uh, geography um, is very, very relevant here because like what is acceptable in the South may mm -hmm. not be so on West Coast, may not be so on a, you know in the New York area. Mm -hmm. I guess tell you about in the South and out here, um, what's crazy is inward with an A is used so fucking much, dude. It is so saturated that it, it is like. I would say I don't know how to really I don't know how to really simplify the explanation here, but like when when you acquire I guess the hood pass or the n word pass or whatever you want to call it, and when I'm using n word, I mean, I'm saying assume here with an a. I would I'll, I'll specify if I mean n word with an r. I'll say like you know hard Wait, r. Wait, aren't or you whatever. aren't you allowed to say that? 
because you're black like on twitch can't you yeah yeah but i've been trying to wait hang on are you you're, you're fucking dude you're no i'm, I'm legit black. asking i don't actually know you should be able to I, say it, right i don't I, I feel like i should but then whenever i deliberately go out of my way to do so i uh i feel i feel guilty because it's it's different for me okay i okay. actually so one okay all right now hang on you're, you're derailing here again here yeah but we do one um even before try hard was was deemed a controversial emote you know let's just call it like post 2016 or post 2015 mm -hmm. um try was considered a you know, it, it grew in popularity. It was used most for toxicity, but the emo itself is not toxic. It's the accountability of the users. The um, I even before then though, like before Trar was was popular, I I actually didn't use the N word very frequently at all. I would say that I uh, if I had like a heated gamer moment, quote unquote, like you know, if I'm playing Smash and I fucking I, I bop someone, yeah, I I may have popped off and said it maybe here and there, but um, if you ask my chat or any of my veteran users, they'll tell you that. It wasn't in my everyday dialogue. I didn't use it excessively or, like, try to, like, advocate for, like, let me just, like, you know, swing my privilege keys in front of every other streamer because, haha, I can say that you can't, you know? Mm -hmm. I never did that. I didn't even go as far as I never used my blackness explicitly to, like, be an extension of my identity to, like, be whoever I am now. I think I've done a pretty great job of not doing that, which I think is, like, the, the I guess the better way to do it, mm -hmm. you know? We unite as people and gamers and I don't have to, like, use, like, my blackness to, like whatever but again it's kind of like a more of like a, a, a philosophical perspective on how i approach my online identity mm -hmm. but moving past that um um fuck i'm sorry where was i going with this now I so i was asking you if people have ever like done like this code switching thing to you do you feel like people like white people change the way they talk oh to you? yeah yeah okay yeah so yeah the i'm also a big a big uh <laughs> if you want to use liberals or i don't know what you sure, call yeah. it, like, progressive fine yeah pro progressive modernization and utilization of language i do believe language does evolve and like what i want to say about it i, I want to say to like make the conversation flow better but like whatever um it you know um oh whatever fuck it's 2019 i'll just say it like you know um what what nigga meant like once upon a time and, and what it, and what it means now uh -huh. like you know your companion your compadre could use as like your uh you know your, your pronoun uh pronoun replacing for like a compassionate thing you know you my brother you my soldier, you my you my fellow guy, and mm -hmm. in the South you see it used a lot by every race. I, I had I had a friend half Vietnamese, half white who used it like sixteen billion percent more than I did. I had another I had another white friend uh, uh, named Dylan who used it. I mean, like every other fucking day it was, or every other every other fucking sentence or whatever. Like mm -hmm. um, there, and it became like habitual. And um, yeah, they, they never they kept it consistent. But they also, I don't know, they also were like, quote unquote, more, more like gangster than I was. You know, they were the ones who were like, you know, smoking like half a pound of weed every given week. They're the ones who like, you know, took smoking to the next level. They're the ones who were like part time, you know, um, uh, dealing. They were the ones who just like did way more of that stuff than I did. You know, by, by comparison, I was very, very tame and honestly a little bit boring because I was just like, you know, I was the gamer who was on, was on Twitch. They were, they were my, um, my roommates who were just like, you know, doing all kinds of stuff by comparison. Um, so the code switching doesn't really exist for me because I'm a very unique example, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm sure, I don't know. I don't, I'm really pretty. Yeah. Once you earn the, 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 the hood pass or like the nigga pass, that's when things change. Sure. But I don't know how to really define exactly how that plays out. Sure. But, um, I wish I could remember specifically who I, I want to say Bill Cosby. I don't think it was Bill Cosby, but I, I've heard that there are like, like there are people in even like, well, I say even there are people in the black community that feel like, like even with the soft A, the N word should never be spoken. That that's something that like people should like leave behind. And like the whole reclaiming it has been like a bad, I want to say it was a Bill Cosby, like him talking about it, that where he said it, but have you ever heard, do you have people that you listen to or, or anybody that you hear, like another black person say like there, this is a word that like even black people shouldn't say anymore or no no one um no one i know is like that mm -hmm. and because probably because i actually probably disagree with them because like i look at it like if you're going to resist the modernization of language like mm -hmm. like okay so, so okay let me, let me give you a parallel example here right if you if you say that the butchering of modern english is an assault on the great writers of even like two centuries ago and you advocate for the banning of all emojis because emojis are further dumbing down vocabulary and and honestly spelling and sentence structure and everything else because of online messaging just frequently interjecting further into our our, our formal English or just because like it replaces 99% of when formal written rhetoric is, is occurring 
do you what, what do you do do you just say you know uh emojis are are the, the bane of society i want to i want to um arbitrarily ban emojis or i want to arbitrarily ban like lazy spelling lazy lack of capitalization lazy punctuation mm -hmm. like what do you what do you realistically do well i don't and think it was like way... ban i don't think anybody's calling for a ban on it but it was and it might have been fuck it might have been oprah even but it was just the idea that like um like these are words that are always going to be used in oppressive manners and even when you reclaim them you know even when you like try to reclaim them or whatever like it doesn't actually get that purpose done like it just it's just something bad that should be erased or whatever I, i'm not sure i'd have to go back and um listen again but uh, maybe because i'm just like a i'm super skeptical here that you can even like you could even do that. I don't even know, like, like realistically, could that even occur? And I think more you need to have the dialogue of just like, uh, of like how language is modernized over time here. Mm -hmm. Because in that regard, you know, once upon a time, the curse words, you know, fuck shit, damn, etc. Weren't those all like explicitly taboo in a much more severe sense 60 or so years ago? And then um, depending on who you want to, on, on the history books here, you can say that, you know, stand-up comedians kind of like made those words a little more you know, because they were the strongest taboo. So comedians, when stamp comedy started to come to the boom, mm -hmm. use those words um, in mass to like, uh, you know, because it's, it's your strongest, most volatile vocabulary to like kind of set a mood for a receptive stand-up audience. And then over time, you know, that it gets a little more legitimized as as explicit because of things like the MPAA, Motion Picture Association of America, where you're just seeing, you know, those words become like, difference between getting a pg and an r rating before the pg-13 rating happened yeah um things like the uh the fcc cracking down on on radio edits i mean i don't even know I, again i don't even know here you know once upon a time was there always in radio edit i imagine probably not you know something had to happen and occur for the standard radio edit of explicit songs to come and i think those all things are like arbitrary boundaries that have led to those words being seen as severe but then the freedom of the internet and the freedom of the communication of the internet with YouTube were like, you know, are you going to, you know, before, before cursing got demonetized on YouTube, um, you know, you just saw like pff, Omega Law, if you were on YouTube in 2009, it was just like, you know, fuck shit, damn, and everything in between. And those curse words, and there's other factors here too, obviously, but those curse words kind of like got like diluted in their intensity. And now the real bad words are the words that go beyond just that now, where they're like conditional particular um words that attack uh, marginalized people so the f slur you know uh i don't want to i guess i could say i'm not i'm not calling one of these yeah, words right. here but you know autistic or, or retard or you know maybe using the word cancer in a derogatory sense because those who are struck with cancer they can't choose that and you're using their their condition to like belittle or try to demean another person so mm -hmm. you know these other words now are seem to be much more um impactful than actual curse words and I feel that's a great, um, and that might be like a, 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 a an example I could use to like show the uh, the modernization of language. And if if I feel like if that, if what I'm explaining here in a very poor manner is like brought up in an educational uh, limelight, mm -hmm. maybe then people will see like the N word with an A differently. Um, for those who oppose it. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, hey, I think we're I'm sorry. Right. That, that was kind of a word salad, but hopefully that hopefully that that came across uh, cohesively enough. Yeah. No problem. I think I think you get your point across pretty well. Um, yeah, cool. that pretty much brings us to two hours. Um, what are you doing on stream today, bro? Today I am. Oh, we didn't even talk. Oh, do you know we should, we should talk about the town hall, man? You didn't? Did you watch any of the town hall on Monday? I didn't, but I actually have it loaded up, and I'm going to do that today. So maybe we can Ooh. hit up that next time too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a man. There's because. All right. Make sure when you do it, I want. I really need you to watch both the Fox News Bernie Bernie Sanders town hall from from last week. As well as whatever you want to skim through on the on the CNN five X Democratic Town Hall uh, mm -hmm. this past Monday, it's really important. I think if you watch both of those, like they're both like particularly CNN Bernie Sanders Town Hall and the Foxers Town Hall, it's night and day in a way you wouldn't expect. Actually, yeah, I saw so, somebody link um one of the questions. Jesus Christ, it was like the fucking. I think it was Tapper <laughs> was asking like, so you want the Boston Marathon bomber to be voting? It's like holy shit. Shit, like these are like some insanely on the CNN one for Bernie. Like, damn, these are insane questions. But oh, dude, it was garbage. Yeah, holy it was garbage, man. They, fuck. <laughs> they tapped him for being a millionaire. They tapped him on the wealth. They they hit him with the, the the dumb shit. Like, well, why don't you just, why don't you just voluntarily donate your taxes for the policy you advocate for? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just like ugh. It, it, it was so many it was so many bad things, dude. I uh, there was a lot of cringe, by the way, too. I don't want to spoil it for you, but like um. I don't know if you're gonna watch the entire thing or not, but I if you are going to just look for the highlights to skip through, you gotta there there Amy 
Amy Klobuchar, dude, has so many, so many cringe moments, dude. It's actually terrible. It's like, it's the problem is it's like almost it's not terrible enough to find completely entertaining, but it is incredibly cringe and very exhausting and very draining. So yeah, check her out. Dude, they gave they gave Kamala Harris some of the most obnoxious softballs that she gets away with fucking murder, dude. By comparison, meanwhile, Bernie gets like. Like questions that just made me think, like, dude, this, this had to be a planted, this had to be a planted agent. There's no way a college is going to ask this question. It's it's so rooted in just trying to be a gotcha for Bernie, and mm-hmm. it was just it was it was it was really really frustrating. So, but yeah, check them out though. Um, I would tell you for sure check out a. Also, yeah, there's there's a couple. There's like two quotes from um from Peter Booty Judge, um, who threw you like some. You'll know when you see them. Our, our chat's gonna be able to easily tell you about them, but like, um, the the idea that uh, um. God, what did he say here? It was like God. God is not affiliated with any with any political party, uh-huh. which kind of comes off as like is God like a undecided centrist? Like, what are you? Uh, it was, yeah, it was it was pretty it was pretty yikes for me. But sure. uh, yeah, check them out when you get a chance. But yeah, we can do that next week. We can we can do Avengers next week. Um, what I'm doing today though is uh, um, fuck, dude, I was, you know, honestly, I still haven't actually watched um your 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 clap back with uh Nick Fuentes, but. I, I kind of debated like, should I even do that? Like, I'm, am I just like going in for like Kabuki theater where I'm just gonna like, I'm going in to watch Idiocracy at its finest with like Nick Fuentes, like doing the gish galloping or doing whatever. And did you watch the I... first one with me, Hassan, Nick Fuentes, and? Yeah, I caught most of that. It's also really long though, right? But yeah. I caught, I caught most of that uh, live. If you watch that, it. I think you should watch my follow up with Fuentes later, and you can see the difference between like a one on one format versus Train Rex's format, and it's why I'm so big on format. Because holy shit, the second time was a lot more brutal than the first time. I really didn't like how the first time turned out. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, well, also, I also feel bad for you because I expected nothing less. Like, um, because I was like, I was wondering, I'm like, wait, why, why do you have Nick Fuentes on here? That guy's literally insane. That guy's like a white nationalist, actually white insane. supremacist, yeah. Yeah, but then I heard that you know, he was like he was a fill in last minute because um the other yeah. person uh, dipped out. Initially, was- I didn't want him, but yeah, train popped him on me like an hour beforehand or some shit. I was like, uh, okay, I guess, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it, sometimes it'd be like that though. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm going to um, you know, I'm still speed running that that new Yoshi game for Switch, you know, because I'm I'm the Yoshi guy, so I'm trying to get a uh, I have world record right now in the category I play, but I'm trying to get better at it. So. Damn. I hop on that and do some um, do some sick speed run stuff, and uh, and go from there. Really, I don't know. I have to kind of, I'm gonna kind of wing it today. I didn't really uh, not gonna lie. You kind of woke me up because I was up I was up really late last night. So I might play some Smash. Might do some uh, do some some high octane tri hex tier gameplay. You know what I mean? Okay, cool. All so, right. Well, I'm gonna throw you that way then. Okay. Appreciate it, fam. Thanks a lot for joining us. We will yeah. both be here next week to talk about the Avengers movie and yeah. the Bernie Town Hall stuff, I guess, and whatever other political stuff and whatnot pops up. So, yeah, thanks a lot for joining us. All and right, dope, man. Yeah, have fun, guys. Peace out. Later.